scrotum, and it had caused me the most intolerable pains at every step. A feverish lassitude, lack of appetite, and the hard work which I had nevertheless done during the day had conspired with the pain to upset me. I was not altogether in a condition to discharge my duties as a physician, but in view of the nature and the location of the malady, it was possible to imagine something else for which I was most of all unfit, namely writing. Now it is this very activity of writing into which I am plunged by the dream. It is the most energetic denial of the pain which imagination could conceive. As a matter of fact, I cannot ride. I do not dream of doing so. I never sat on a horse but once, and then without a saddle, and I did not like it. But in this dream I ride as though I had no boil on the perineum, or rather I ride just because I want to have none. Probably being thus comforted, I did not feel anything of my pain during the first few hours of my sleep. Then the painful sensations made themselves felt and tried to wake me. Whereupon the dream came and said to me soothingly, Go on sleeping. You are not going to wake. You have no boil, for you are riding on horseback, and with a boil just there no one could ride. And the dream was successful. The pain was stifled, and I went on sleeping. But the dream was not satisfied with suggesting away the boil by tenaciously holding fast to an idea incompatible with the malady, thus behaving like the hallucinatory insanity of a mother who has lost her child or of a merchant who has lost his fortune. In addition, the details of the sensation denied and of the image used to suppress it serve the dream also as a means to connect other material actually present in the mind with the situation in the dream, and to give this material representation. I am riding on a gray horse. The color of the horse exactly corresponds with the pepper and salt suit in which I last saw my colleague P in the country. I have been warned that highly seasoned food is the cause of boils, and in any case it is preferable as an etiological explanation to sugar, which might be thought of in connection with furunculosis. My friend P. likes to ride the high horse with me ever since he took my place in the treatment of a female patient, in whose case I had performed great feats but who really, like the horse in the story of the Sunday equestrian, led me wherever she wished. Thus the horse comes to be a symbolic representation of a lady patient. In the dream it is highly intelligent. I feel quite at home refers to the position which I occupied in the patient's household until I was replaced by my colleague P., I thought you were safe in the saddle up there, one of my few well-wishers among the eminent physicians of the city recently said to me, with reference to the same household. And it was a feat to practice psychotherapy for eight to ten hours a day while suffering such pain. But I know that I cannot continue my peculiarly strenuous work for any length of time without perfect physical health. And the dream is full of dismal allusions to the situation which would result if my illness continued. The note, such as neurasthenics carry and show to their doctors, do not work, do not eat. On further interpretation, I see that the dream activity has succeeded in finding its way from the wish situation of riding to some very early childish quarrels which must have occurred between myself and a nephew who is a year older than I and is now living in England. It has also taken up elements from my journeys in Italy. The street in the dream is built up out of impressions of Verona and Siena. 
A still deeper interpretation leads to sexual dream thoughts, and I recall what the dream allusions to that beautiful country were supposed to mean in the dream of a female patient who had never been to Italy. Parentheses, to Italy, German, colon, gen Italian, equals genitals, and parentheses. At the same time, there are references to the house in which I preceded my friend P. as physician and to the place where the boil is located. In another dream, I was similarly successful in warding off a threatened disturbance of my sleep. This time, the threat came from a sensory stimulus. It was only chance, however, that enabled me to discover the connection between the dream and the accidental dream stimulus, and in this way to understand the dream. One midsummer morning in a Tyrolese mountain resort, I woke with the knowledge that I had dreamed the Pope is dead. I was not able to interpret this short, non-visual dream. I could remember only one possible basis of the dream, namely, that shortly before this, the newspapers had reported that His Holiness was slightly indisposed. But in the course of the morning, my wife asked me, Did you hear the dreadful tolling of the church bells this morning? I had no idea that I had heard it, but now I understood my dream. It was the reaction of my need for sleep to the noise by which the pious Tyrolians were trying to wake me. I avenged myself on them by the conclusion which formed the content of my dream and continued to sleep without any further interest in the tolling of the bells. Among the dreams mentioned in the previous chapters, there are several which might serve as examples of the elaboration of so-called nerve stimuli. The dream of drinking in long drafts is such an example. Here the somatic stimulus seems to be the sole source of the dream, and the wish arising from the sensation, thirst, the only motive for dreaming. We find much the same thing in other simple dreams, where the somatic stimulus is able of itself to generate a wish. The dream of the sick woman who throws the cooling apparatus from her cheek at night is an instance of an unusual manner of reaching to a pain stimulus with a wish fulfillment. It seems as though the patient had temporarily succeeded in making herself analgesic and accompanied this by ascribing her pains to a stranger. My dream of the three Parsi is obviously a hunger dream, but it has contrived to shift the need for food right back to the child's longing for its mother's breast, and to use a harmless desire as a mask for a more serious one that cannot venture to express itself so openly. In the dream of Count Thun, we were able to see by what paths an accidental physical need was brought into relation with the strongest, but also the most rigorously repressed impulses of the psychic life. And when, as in the case reported by Garnier, the first consul incorporates the sound of an exploding infernal machine into a dream of battle before it causes him to wait, the true purpose for which alone psychic activity concerns itself with sensations during sleep is revealed with unusual clarity. A young lawyer who is full of his first great bankruptcy case and falls asleep in the afternoon behaves just as the great Napoleon did. He dreams of a certain G. Reich in Husayatin, whose acquaintance he has made in connection with the bankruptcy case. But Husayatin forces itself upon his attention still further. He is obliged to wake only to hear his wife who is suffering from bronchial catarrh, violently coughing. Let us compare the dream of Napoleon I, who incidentally was an excellent sleeper, with that of the sleepy student who was awakened by his landlady with the reminder that he had to go to the hospital. 
and who thereupon dreamt himself into a bed in the hospital, and then slept on, the underlying reasoning being as follows. If I am already in the hospital, I needn't get up to go there. This is obviously a convenience dream. The sleeper frankly admits to himself his motive in dreaming, but he thereby reveals one of the secrets of dreaming in general. In a certain sense, all dreams are convenience dreams. They serve the purpose of continuing to sleep instead of waking. The dream is the guardian of sleep, not its disturber. In another place, we shall have occasion to justify this conception in respect to the psychic factors that make for waking, but we can already demonstrate its applicability to the objective external stimuli. Either the mind does not concern itself at all with the causes of sensations during sleep, if it is able to carry this attitude through as against the intensity of the stimuli and their significance, of which it is well aware, or it employs the dream to deny these stimuli, or thirdly, if it is obliged to recognize the stimuli, it seeks that interpretation of them which will represent the actual sensation as a component of a desired situation which is compatible with sleep. The actual sensation is woven into the dream in order to deprive it of its reality. Napoleon is permitted to go on sleeping, if it is only a dream, memory of the thunder, of the guns at our coal which is trying to disturb him. The two sources from which I know of this dream do not entirely agree as to its content. The wish to sleep to which the conscious ego has adjusted itself, and which, together with the dream censorship and the secondary elaboration to be mentioned later, represents the ego's contribution to the dream, must thus always be taken into account as a motive of dream formation, and every successful dream is a fulfillment of this wish. The relation of this general, constantly present and unvarying sleep wish to the other wishes of which now one and now another is fulfilled by the dream content will be the subject of later consideration. In the wish to sleep, we have discovered a motive capable of supplying the deficiency in the theory of Strumpel and Wundt, and of explaining the perversity and capriciousness of the interpretation of the external stimulus. The correct interpretation, of which the sleeping mind is perfectly capable, would involve active interest and would require the sleeper to wake. Hence, of those interpretations which are possible at all, only such are admitted as are acceptable to the dictatorial censorship of the sleep wish. The logic of dream situations would run, for example, it is the nightingale and not the lark. For if it is the lark, love's night is at an end. From among the interpretations of the stimulus, which are thus admissible, that one is selected which can secure the best connection with the wish impulses that are lying in wait in the mind. Thus everything is definitely determined, and nothing is left to caprice. The misinterpretation is not an illusion, but, if you will, an excuse. Here again, as in substitution by displacement in the service of the dream censorship, we have an act of deflection of the normal psychic procedure. If the external nerve stimuli and the inner bodily stimuli are sufficiently intense to compel psychic attention, they represent, that is, if they result in dreaming at all and not in waking, a fixed point for dream formation, a nucleus in the dream material, for which an appropriate wish fulfillment is sought, just as mediating ideas between two psychical dream stimuli are sought. To this extent, it is true of a number of dreams that the somatic element dictates the dream content. 
In this extreme case, even a wish that is not actually present may be aroused for the purpose of dream formation. But the dream cannot do otherwise than represent a wish in some situation as fulfilled. It is, as it were, confronted with the task of discovering what wish can be represented as fulfilled by the given sensation. Even if this given material is of a painful or disagreeable character, yet it is not unserviceable for the purposes of dream formation. The psychic life has at its disposal even wishes whose fulfillment evokes displeasure, which seems a contradiction but becomes perfectly intelligible if we take into account the presence of two sorts of psychic instants and the censorship that subsists between them. In the psychic life there exist, as we have seen, repressed wishes which belong to the first system and to whose fulfillment the second system is opposed. We do not mean this in a historic sense, that such wishes have once existed and have subsequently been destroyed. The doctrine of repression, which we need in the study of psychoneuroses, asserts that such repressed wishes still exist, but simultaneously with an inhibition which weighs them down. Language has hit upon the truth when it speaks of the suppression, in parentheses, sub-pression, or pushing under, in parentheses, of such impulses. The psychic mechanism which enables such suppressed wishes to force their way to realization is retained in being and in working order. But if it happens that such a suppressed wish is fulfilled, the vanquished inhibition of the second system, which is capable of consciousness, is then expressed as discomfort. And, in order to conclude this argument, if sensations of a disagreeable character which originate from somatic sources are present during sleep, this constellation is utilized by the dream activity to procure the fulfillment with more or less maintenance of the censorship of an otherwise suppressed wish. This state of affairs makes possible a certain number of anxiety dreams, while others of these dream formations which are unfavorable to the wish theory exhibit a different mechanism. For the anxiety in dreams may of course be of a psychoneurotic character, originating in psychosexual excitation, in which case the anxiety corresponds to repressed libido. Then this anxiety, like the whole anxiety dream, has the significance of a neurotic symptom, and we stand at the dividing line where the wish-fulfilling tendency of dreams is frustrated. But in other anxiety dreams, the feeling of anxiety comes from somatic sources, as in the case of persons suffering from pulmonary or cardiac trouble, with occasional difficulty in breathing. And then it is used to help such strongly suppressed wishes to attain fulfillment in a dream, the dreaming of which, from psychic motives, would have resulted in the same release of anxiety. It is not difficult to reconcile these two apparently contradictory cases. When two psychic formations, an effective inclination and a conceptual content, are intimately connected, either one being actually present will evoke the other, even in a dream. Now the anxiety of somatic origin evokes the suppressed conceptual content, now it is the released conceptual content accompanied by sexual excitement which causes the release of anxiety. In the one case, it may be said that a somatically determined affect is psychically interpreted. In the other case, all is of psychic origin, but the content which has been suppressed is easily replaced by a somatic interpretation which fits the anxiety. The difficulties which lie in the way of understanding all this have little to do with dreams, 
They are due to the fact that in discussing these points, we are touching upon the problems of the development of anxiety and of repression. The general aggregate of bodily sensation must undoubtedly be included among the dominant dream stimuli of internal bodily origin. Not that it is capable of supplying the dream content, but it forces the dream thoughts to make a choice from the material destined to serve the purpose of representation in the dream content, inasmuch as it brings within easy reach that part of the material which is adapted to its own character, and holds the rest at a distance. Moreover, this general feeling which survives from the preceding day is, of course, connected with the psychic residues that are significant for the dream. Moreover, this feeling itself may be either maintained or overcome in the dream, so that it may, if it is painful, veer around into its opposite. If the somatic sources of excitation during sleep, that is, the sensations of sleep, are not of unusual intensity, the part which they play in dream formation is, in my judgment, similar to that of those impressions of the day which are still recent but of no great significance. I mean that they are utilized for the dream formation if they are of such a kind that they can be united with the conceptual content of the psychic dream source, but not otherwise. They are treated as a cheap, ever-ready material which can be used whenever is needed, and not as valuable material which itself prescribes the manner in which it must be utilized. I might suggest the analogy of a connoisseur giving an artist a rare stone, a piece of onyx, for example, in order that it may be fashioned into a work of art. Here the size of the stone, its color, and its markings help to decide what head or what scene shall be represented, while if he is dealing with a uniform and abundant material such as marble or sandstone, the artist is guided only by the idea which takes shape in his mind. Only in this way, it seems to me, can we explain the fact that the dream content furnished by physical stimuli of somatic origin, which are not unusually accentuated, does not make its appearance in all dreams and every night. Perhaps an example which takes us back to the interpretation of dreams will best illustrate my meaning. One day I was trying to understand the significance of the sensation of being inhibited, of not being able to move from the spot, of not being able to get something done, etc., which occurs so frequently in dreams and is so closely allied to anxiety. That night I had the following dream. I am very incompletely dressed, and I go from a flat on the ground floor, up a flight of stairs to an upper story. In doing this, I jump up three stairs at a time, and I am glad to find that I can mount the stairs so quickly. Suddenly I notice that a servant maid is coming down the stairs, that is, towards me. I am ashamed and try to hurry away, and now comes this feeling of being inhibited. I am glued to the stairs and cannot move from the spot. Analysis The situation of the dream is taken from an everyday reality. In a house in Vienna, I have two apartments which are connected only by the main staircase. My consultation rooms and my study are on the raised ground floor, and my living rooms are on the first floor. Late at night, when I have finished my work downstairs, I go upstairs to my bedroom. On the evening before the dream, I had actually gone this short distance with my garments in disarray. That is, I had taken off my collar, tie, and cuffs. But in the dream, this had changed into a more advanced, but, as usual, indefinite degree of undress. It is a habit of mine to run up two or three steps at a time. Moreover, there was a wish fulfillment recognized even in the dream, for the ease with which I run upstairs reassures me as to the condition of my heart. 
Further, the manner in which I run upstairs is an effective contrast to the sensation of being inhibited which occurs in the second half of the dream. It shows me, what needed no proof, that dreams have no difficulty in representing motor actions fully and completely carried out. Think, for example, of flying in dreams. But the stairs up which I go are not those of my own house. At first I do not recognize them. Only the person coming towards me informs me of their whereabouts. This woman is the maid of an old lady whom I visit twice daily in order to give her hypodermic injections. The stairs, too, are precisely similar to those which I have to climb twice a day in this old lady's house. How do these stairs and the woman get into my dream? The shame of not being fully dressed is undoubtedly of a sexual character. The servant of whom I dream is older than I, surly and by no means attractive. These questions remind me of the following incident. When I pay my morning visit at this house, I am usually seized with a desire to clear my throat. The sputum falls on the stairs. There is no spittoon on either of the two floors, and I consider that the stairs should be kept clean, not at my expense, but rather by the provision of a spittoon. The housekeeper, another elderly curmudgeonly person, but, as I willingly admit, a woman of cleanly instincts, takes a different view of the matter. She lies in wait for me to see whether I shall take the liberty referred to, and if she sees that I do, I can distinctly hear her growl. For days thereafter, when we meet, she refuses to greet me with the customary signs of respect. On the day before the dream, the housekeeper's attitude was reinforced by that of the maid. I had just furnished my usual hurried visit to the patient when the servant confronted me in the anteroom, observing, You might as well have wiped your shoes today, doctor, before you came into the room. The red carpet is all dirty again from your feet. This is the only justification for the appearance of the stairs and the maid in my dream. Between my leaping upstairs and my spitting on the stairs, there is an intimate connection. Pharyngitis and cardiac troubles are both supposed to be punishments for the vice of smoking, on account of which vice my own housekeeper does not credit me with excessive tidiness, so that my reputation suffers in both the houses, which my dream fuses into one. I must postpone the further interpretation of this dream until I can indicate the origin of the typical dream of being incompletely clothed. In the meantime, as a provisional deduction from the dream just related, I note that the dream sensation of inhibited movement is always aroused at a point where a certain connection requires it. A peculiar condition of my motor system during sleep cannot be responsible for this dream content, since a moment earlier I found myself as though in confirmation of this fact, skipping lightly up the stairs. End of section 19. Recording by Judith Parker, drjudithparker.com. Section 20 of the Interpretation of Dreams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz. The Interpretation of Dreams by Sigmund Freud. Translated by A. A. Brill. Section 20. Typical Dreams. The Embarrassment Dream of Nakedness. Generally speaking, we are not in a position to interpret another person's dream if he is unwilling to furnish us with the unconscious thoughts which lie behind the dream content, and for this reason the practical applicability of our method of dream interpretation is often seriously restricted. 
but there are dreams which exhibit a complete contrast to the individual's customary liberty to endow his dream world with a special individuality, thereby making it inaccessible to an alien understanding. There are a number of dreams which almost everyone has dreamed in the same manner, and of which we are accustomed to assume that they have the same significance in the case of every dreamer. A peculiar interest attaches to these typical dreams, because no matter who dreams them, they presumably all derive from the same sources, so that they would seem to be particularly fitted to provide us with information as to the sources of dreams. With quite special expectations, therefore, we shall proceed to test our technique of dream interpretation on these typical dreams, and only with extreme reluctance shall we admit that precisely in respect of this material our method is not fully verified. In the interpretation of typical dreams we, as a rule, fail to obtain those associations from the dreamer which in other cases have led us to comprehension of the dream, or else these associations are confused and inadequate, so that they do not help us to solve our problem. Why this is the case, and how we can remedy this defect in our technique, are points which will be discussed in a later chapter. The reader will then understand why I can deal with only a few of the group of typical dreams in this chapter, and why I have postponed the discussion of the others. A. The Embarrassment Dream of Nakedness In a dream in which one is naked, or scantily clad in the presence of strangers, it sometimes happens that one is not in the least ashamed of one's condition. But the dream of nakedness demands our attention only when shame and embarrassment are felt in it, when one wishes to escape or to hide, and when one feels the strange inhibition of being unable to stir from the spot, and of being utterly powerless to alter the painful situation. It is only in this connection that the dream is typical. Otherwise, the nucleus of its content may be involved in all sorts of other connections, or may be replaced by individual amplifications. The essential point is that one has a painful feeling of shame, and is anxious to hide one's nakedness, usually by means of locomotion, but is absolutely unable to do so. I believe that the great majority of my readers will at some time have found themselves in this situation in a dream. The nature and manner of the exposure is usually rather vague. The dreamer will say, perhaps, I was in my chemise, but this is rarely a clear image. In most cases, the lack of clothing is so indeterminate that it is described in narrating the dream by an alternative I was in my chemise or my petticoat. As a rule, the deficiency in clothing is not serious enough to justify the feeling of shame attached to it. For a man who has served in the army, nakedness is often replaced by a manner of dressing that is contrary to regulations. I was in the street without my saber, and I saw some officers approaching. Or, I had no collar. Or, I was wearing checked civilian trousers, etc. The persons before whom one is ashamed are almost always strangers, whose faces remain indeterminate. It never happens in the typical dream that one is reproved or even noticed on account of the lack of clothing, which causes one such embarrassment. On the contrary, the people in the dream appear to be quite indifferent or, as I was able to note in one particularly vivid dream, they have stiff and solemn expressions. This gives us food for thought. The dreamer's embarrassment and the spectator's indifference constitute a contradiction such as often occurs in dreams. It would be more in keeping with the dreamer's feelings if the strangers were to look at him in astonishment, or were to laugh at him, or be outraged. I think, however, that this obnoxious feature has been displaced by wish-fulfillment, while the embarrassment is for some reason retained, so that the two components are not in agreement. 
we have an interesting proof that the dream which is partially distorted by wish fulfillment has not been properly understood for it has been made the basis of a fairy tale familiar to us all in anderson's version of the emperor's new clothes and it has more recently received poetical treatment by fulda in the talisman in anderson's fairy tale we are told of two impostors who weave a costly garment for the emperor which shall however be visible only to the good and true the emperor goes forth clad to this invisible garment and since the imaginary fabric serves as a sort of touchstone the people are frightened into behaving as though they did not notice the emperor's nakedness but this is really the situation in our dream it is not very venturesome to assume that the unintelligible dream content has provided an incentive to invent a state of undress which gives meaning to the situation present in the memory this situation is thereby robbed of its original meaning and made to serve alien ends but we shall see that such a misunderstanding of the dream content often occurs through the conscious activity of a second psychic system and is to be recognized as a factor of the final form of the dream and further that in the development of obsessions and phobias similar misunderstandings still of course within the same psychic personality play a decisive part it is even possible to specify whence the material for the fresh interpretation of the dream is taken the impostor is the dream the emperor is the dreamer himself and the moralizing tendency betrays a hazy knowledge of the fact that there is a question in the latent dream content of forbidden wishes victims of repression the connection in which such dreams appear during my analysis of neurotics proves beyond a doubt that a memory of the dreamer's earliest childhood lies at the foundation of the dream only in our childhood was there a time when we were seen by our relatives as well as by strange nurses servants and visitors in a state of insufficient clothing and at that time we were not ashamed of our nakedness in the case of many rather older children it may be observed that being undressed has an exciting effect upon them instead of making them feel ashamed they laugh leap about slap or thump their own bodies the mother or whoever is present scolds them saying fie that is shameful you mustn't do that children often show a desire to display themselves it is hardly possible to pass through a village in country districts without meeting a two or three year old child who lifts up his or her blouse or frock before the traveler possibly in his honor one of my patients has retained in his conscious memory a scene from his eighth year in which after undressing for bed he wanted to dance into his little sister's room in his shirt but was prevented by the servant in the history of the childhood of neurotics exposure before children of the opposite sex plays a prominent part in paranoia the delusion of being observed while dressing and undressing may be directly traced to these experiences and among those who have remained perverse there is a class in whom the childish impulse is accentuated into a symptom the class of exhibitionists this age of childhood in which the sense of shame is unknown seems a paradise when we look back upon it later and paradise itself is nothing but the mass fantasy of the childhood of the individual this is why in paradise men are naked and unashamed until the moment arrives when shame and fear awaken expulsion follows and sexual life and cultural development begin into this paradise dreams can take us back every night we have already ventured the conjecture that the impressions of our earliest childhood from the prehistoric period until about the end of the third year crave reproduction for their own sake perhaps without further reference to their content so that their repetition is a wish fulfillment dreams of nakedness then are exhibition dreams the nucleus of an exhibition dream is furnished by one's own person which is seen not as that of a child but as it exists in the present 
and by the idea of scanty clothing which emerges indistinctly, owing to the superimposition of so many later situations of being partially clothed, or out of consideration for the censorship. To these elements are added the persons in whose presence one is ashamed. I know of no example in which the actual spectators of these infantile exhibitions reappear in a dream, for a dream is hardly ever a simple recollection. Strangely enough, those persons who are the objects of our sexual interest in childhood are omitted from all reproductions, in dreams, in hysteria or in obsessional neurosis. Paranoia alone restores the spectators, and is fanatically convinced of their presence, although they remain unseen. The substitute for these persons offered by the dream, the number of strangers who take no notice of the spectacle offered them, is precisely the counter-wish to that single, intimately known person for whom the exposure was intended. A number of strangers, moreover, often occur in dreams in all sorts of other connections. As a counter-wish, they always signify a secret. It will be seen that even that restitution of the old state of affairs that occurs in paranoia complies with this counter-tendency. One is no longer alone. One is quite positively being watched. But the spectators are a number of strange, curiously indeterminate people. For obvious reasons, the presence of the whole family in the dream has the same significance. Furthermore, repression finds a place in the exhibition dream, for the disagreeable sensation of the dream is, of course, the reaction on the part of the second psychic instance to the fact that the exhibitionistic scene, which has been condemned by the censorship, has nevertheless succeeded in presenting itself. The only way to avoid this sensation would be to refrain from reviving the scene. In a later chapter we shall deal once again with the feeling of inhibition. In our dreams it represents to perfection a conflict of the will, a denial. According to our unconscious purpose, the exhibition is to proceed. According to the demands of the censorship, it is to come to an end. The relation of our typical dreams to fairy tales and other fiction and poetry is neither sporadic nor accidental. Sometimes the penetrating insight of the poet has analytically recognized the process of transformation of which the poet is otherwise the instrument, and has followed it up in the reverse direction, that is to say, has traced a poem to a dream. A friend has called my attention to the following passage in G. Keller's Der Grün Heinrich. I do not wish, dear Lee, that you should ever come to realize from experience the exquisite and piquant truth in the situation of Odysseus, when he appears naked and covered with mud, before Nausicaa and her playmates. Would you like to know what it means? Let us for a moment consider the incident closely. If you are ever parted from your home, and from all that is dear to you, and wander about in a strange country, if you have seen much and experienced much, if you have cares and sorrows, and are perhaps utterly wretched and forlorn, you will some night inevitably dream that you are approaching your home. You will see it shining and glittering in the loveliest colors. Lovely and gracious figures will come to meet you, and then you will suddenly discover that you are ragged, naked, and covered with dust. An indescribable feeling of shame and fear overcomes you. You try to cover yourself, to hide and you wake up bathed in sweat. As long as humanity exists, this will be the dream of the care-laden, tempest-tossed man. And thus Homer has drawn this situation from the profoundest depths of the eternal nature of humanity. What are the profoundest depths of the eternal nature of humanity? which the poet commonly hopes to awaken in his listeners, but these stirrings of the psychic life which are rooted in that age of childhood, which subsequently becomes prehistoric. Childish wishes, now suppressed and forbidden, break into the dream behind the unobjectionable and permissibly conscious wishes of the homeless man, and it is for this reason that the dream, which is objectified in the legend of Nausicaa, 
regularly develops into an anxiety dream. My own dream of hurrying upstairs, which presently changed into being glued to the stairs, is likewise an exhibition dream, for it reveals the essential ingredients of such a dream. It must therefore be possible to trace it back to experiences in my childhood, and the knowledge of these should enable us to conclude how far the servant's behavior to me, that is, her reproach that I had soiled the carpet, helped her to secure the position which she occupies in the dream. Now I am actually able to furnish the desired explanation. One learns in a psychoanalysis to interpret temporal proximity by material connection. Two ideas which are apparently without connection, but which occur in immediate succession, belong to a unity which has to be deciphered. Just as an A and A B, when written in succession, must be pronounced as one syllable, ab, it is just the same with the interrelations of dreams. The dream of the stairs has been taken from a series of dreams with whose other members I am familiar, having interpreted them. A dream included in this series must belong to the same context. Now the other dreams of the series are based on the memory of a nurse to whom I was entrusted for a season, from the time when I was still at the breast to the age of two and a half, and of whom a hazy recollection has remained in my consciousness. According to information which I recently obtained from my mother, she was old and ugly, but very intelligent and thorough. According to the inferences which I am justified in drawing from my dreams, she did not always treat me quite kindly but spoke harshly to me when I showed insufficient understanding of the necessity for cleanliness. Inasmuch as the maid endeavored to continue my education in this respect, she is entitled to be treated, in my dream, as an incarnation of the prehistoric old woman. It is to be assumed, of course, that the child was fond of his teacher in spite of her harsh behavior. End of section 20 Recording by Pamela Krantz Section 21 of The Interpretation of Dreams. This is LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tony Hall. The Interpretation of Dreams by Sigmund Freud. Translated by A. A. Brill. Section 21. Dreams of the Death of Beloved Persons. Another series of dreams which may be called typical are those whose content is that a beloved relative, a parent, brother, sister, child or the like has died. We must at once distinguish two classes of such dreams, those in which the dreamer remains unmoved and those in which he feels profoundly grieved by the death of the beloved person, even expressing this grief by shedding tears in his sleep. We may ignore the dreams of the first group. They have no claim to be reckoned as typical. If they are analysed, it is found that they signify something that is not contained in them, that they are intended to mask another wish of some kind. This is the case in the dream of the aunt who sees the only son of her sister lying on a bier. Chapter 4 the dream does not mean that she desires the death of her little nephew. As we have learned, it merely conceals the wish to see a certain beloved person again after a long separation. The same person whom she has seen after as long an interval at the funeral of another nephew. This wish, which is the real content of the dream, gives no cause for sorrow, and for that reason no sorrow is felt in the dream. We see here that the feeling contained in the dream does not belong to the manifest, but to the latent dream content, and that the effective content has remained free from the distortion which has befallen the conceptual content. It is otherwise with those dreams in which the death of a beloved relative is imagined, and in which a painful effect is felt. These signify, as their content tells us, the wish that the person in question might die, and since I may here expect that the feelings of all my readers, and of all who have had such dreams, will lead them to reject my explanation, I must endeavour to rest my proof on the broadest possible basis. 
We have already cited a dream from which we could see that the wishes represented as fulfilled in dreams are not always current wishes. There may also be bygone, discarded, buried and repressed wishes, which we must nevertheless credit with a sort of continued existence, merely on account of their reappearance in a dream. They are not dead like persons who have died, in the sense that we know death, but are rather like the shades in the Odyssey which awaken to a certain degree of life so soon as they have drunk blood. The dream of the dead child in the box, chapter 4, contained a wish that had been present fifteen years earlier, and which had at that time been frankly admitted as real. Further, and this perhaps is not unimportant from the standpoint of the theory of dreams, a recollection from the dreamer's earliest childhood was at the root of this wish also. When the dreamer was a little child, but exactly when cannot be definitely determined, she heard that her mother, during the pregnancy of which she was the outcome, had fallen into a profound emotional depression, and had passionately wished for the death of the child in her womb. Having herself grown up and become pregnant, she was only following the example of her mother. If anyone dreams that his father or mother, his brother or sister, has died, and his dream expresses grief, I should never adduce this as proof that he wishes any of them dead now. The theory of dreams does not go as far as to require this. It is satisfied with concluding that the dreamer has wished them dead at some time or other during his childhood. I fear, however, that this limitation will not go far to appease my critics. Probably they will just as energetically deny the possibility that they ever had such thoughts, as they protest that they do not harbour them now. I must, therefore, reconstruct a portion of the submerged infantile psychology on the basis of the evidence of the present. Let us first of all consider the relation of children to their brothers and sisters. I do not know why we presuppose that it must be a loving one, since examples of enmity among adult brothers and sisters are frequent in everyone's experience. And since we are so often able to verify the fact that this estrangement originated during childhood, or has always existed. Moreover, many adults who today are devoted to their brother and sisters, and support them in adversity, lived with them in almost continuous enmity during their childhood. The elder child ill-treated the younger, slandered him and robbed him of his toys. The younger was consumed with helpless fury against the elder, envied and feared him, or his earliest impulse toward liberty and his first revolt against injustice were directed against his oppressor. The parents say that the children do not agree, and cannot find the reason for it. It is not difficult to see that the character even of a well-behaved child is not the character we should wish to find in an adult. A child is absolutely egoistical. He feels his wants acutely and strives remorselessly to satisfy them, especially against his competitors, other children, and first of all against his brothers and sisters. And yet we do not on that account call a child wicked. We call him naughty. He is not responsible for his misdeeds, either in our own judgment or in the eyes of the law. And this is as it should be. For we may expect within the very period of life which we reckon as childhood, altruistic impulses and morality will awake in a little egoist, and that, in the words of Maynard, a secondary ego will overlay and inhibit the primary ego. Morality, of course, does not develop simultaneously in all its departments, and furthermore, the duration of the amoral period of childhood differs in different individuals. Where this morality fails to develop, we are prone to speak of degeneration, but here the case is obviously one of arrested development. Where the primary character is already overlaid by the later development, it may be at least partially uncovered again by an attack of hysteria. The correspondence between the so-called hysterical character and that of a naughty child is positively striking. The obsessional neurosis, on the other hand, corresponds to a supermorality, which develops as a strong reinforcement against the primary character that is threatening to revive. 
Many persons then, who now love their brothers and sisters, and who would feel bereaved by their death, harbour in their unconscious hostile wishes, survivals from an earlier period, wishes which are able to realise themselves in dreams. It is, however, quite especially interesting to observe the behaviour of little children, up to their third or fourth year, towards their younger brothers or sisters. So far the child has been the only one. Now he is informed that the stork has brought a new baby. The child inspects the new arrival, and expresses his opinion with decision. The stork had better take it back again! Hans, whose phobia was the subject of the analysis in the above-mentioned publication, cried out at the age of three and a half, while feverish, shortly after the birth of a sister, but I don't want to have a little sister. In his neurosis, eighteen months later, he frankly confessed the wish that his mother should drop the child into the bath while bathing it, in order that it might die. With all this, Hans was a good-natured, affectionate child, who soon became fond of his sister and took her under his special protection. I seriously declare it as my opinion that a child is able to estimate the disadvantages which he has to expect on account of a newcomer. A connection of mine, who now gets on very well with a sister who is four years her junior, responded to the news of his sister's arrival with the reservation, but I shan't give her my red cap anyhow. If the child should come to realise only at a later stage that its happiness may be prejudiced by a younger brother or sister, its enmity will be aroused at this period. I know of a case where a girl, not three years of age, tried to strangle an infant in its cradle because she suspected that its continued presence boded her no good. Children at this time of life are capable of a jealousy that is perfectly evident and extremely intense. Again, perhaps the little brother or sister really soon disappears, and the child once more draws to himself the whole affection of the household. Then a new child is sent by the stork. Is it not natural that the favourite should conceive the wish that the new rival might meet the same fate as the earlier one, in order that he may be as happy as he was before the birth of the first child, and during the interval after his death? Of course, this attitude of the child towards the younger brother or sister is, under normal circumstances, a mere function of the difference of age. After a certain interval, the maternal instincts of the older girl will be awakened towards the helpless newborn infant. Such cases of death in the experience of children may soon be forgotten in the family, but psychoanalytical investigation shows that they are very significant for a later neurosis. Feelings of hostility towards brothers and sisters must occur far more frequently in children than is observed by the obtuse elders. Since the above was written, a great many observations relating to the originally hostile attitude of children towards their brothers and sisters, and toward one of their parents, have been recorded in the literature of psychoanalysis. One writer, Spitteler, gives the following peculiarly sincere and ingenious description of this typical childish attitude as he experienced in his earliest childhood. Moreover, there was now a second Adolf, a little creature whom they declared was my brother. I could not understand what he could be for, or why they should pretend he was a being like myself. I was sufficient unto myself. What did I want with a brother? And he was not only useless, he was also even troublesome. When I plagued my grandmother, he too wanted to plague her. When I was wheeled about in the baby carriage, he sat opposite me and took up half the room so that we could not help kicking one another. In the case of my own children, who followed one another rapidly, I missed the opportunity of making such observations. I am now retrieving it, thanks to my little nephew, whose undisputed domination was disturbed after fifteen months by the arrival of a feminine rival. I hear, it is true, that the young man behaves very chivalrously towards his little sister, that he kisses her hand and strokes her, but in spite of this... I have convinced myself that even before the completion of his second year, he is using his new command of language to criticise this person, who, to him, after all, seems superfluous. Whenever the conversation turns upon her, he chimes in and cries angrily, Too little! Too little! During the first few months, since the child has outgrown this disparagement, 
owing to her splendid development, he has found another reason for his insistence that she does not deserve so much attention. He reminds us on every suitable pretext, she hasn't any teeth. We all of us recollect the case of the eldest daughter of another sister of mine. The child, who was then six years of age, spent a full half hour in going from one aunt to another with a question, Lucy can't understand that, can she? Lucy was her rival, two and a half years younger. The three and a half year old Hans embodied his devastating criticism of his little sister in these identical words, Lock sit. He assumed that she was unable to speak on account of her lack of teeth. I have never failed to come across this dream of the death of brothers or sisters, denoting an intense hostility, e.g. I have met it in all my female patients. I have met with only one exception, which could easily be interpreted into a confirmation of the rule. Once, in the course of a sitting, when I was explaining the state of affairs to a female patient, since it seemed to have some bearing on the symptoms under consideration that day, she answered, to my astonishment, that she had never had such dreams. But another dream occurred to her, which presumably had nothing to do with the case, a dream which she had first dreamed at the age of four, when she was the youngest child, and had since then dreamed repeatedly. A number of children, all her brothers and sisters with her boy and girl cousins, were romping about in a meadow. Suddenly they all grew wings, flew up and were gone. She had no idea of the significance of this dream, but we can hardly fail to recognise it as a dream of the death of all the brothers and sisters in its original form and but little influenced by the censorship. I will venture to add the following analysis of it. On the death of one out of this large number of children, in this case the children of two brothers were brought up together as brothers and sisters, would not our dreamer, at that time not yet four years of age, have asked some wise grown-up person, what becomes of children when they are dead? The answer would probably have been, they grow wings and become angels. After this explanation, all the brothers and sisters and cousins in the dreams now have wings like angels, and, this is the most important point, they fly away. Our little angel maker is left alone. Just think, the only one out of such a crowd. That the children romp about a meadow, from which they fly away, points almost certainly to butterflies. It is as though the child had been influenced by the same association of ideas which led the ancients to imagine psyche, the soul, with the wings of a butterfly. Perhaps some readers will now object that the inimical impulses of children towards their brothers and sisters may perhaps be admitted, but how does the childish character arrive at such heights of wickedness as to desire the death of a rival or a stronger playmate, as though all misdeeds could be atoned for only by death? Those who speak in this fashion forget that the child's idea of being dead has little but the word in common with our own. The child knows nothing of the horrors of decay, of shivering in the cold grave, of the terror of the infinite nothing, the thought of which the adult, as all the myths of the hereafter testify, finds so intolerable. The fear of death is alien to the child, and so he plays with the horrid word and threatens another child. If you do that again, you will die, just like Francis died. At which the poor mother shudders, unable perhaps to forget that the greater proportion of mortals do not survive beyond the years of childhood. Even at the age of eight, a child returning from a visit to a natural history museum may say to her mother, Mama, I do love you so. If you ever die, I am going to have you stuffed and set you up here in the room, so that I can always see you. So different from our own is the childish conception of being dead. To my astonishment, I was told that a highly intelligent boy of ten, after the sudden death of his father, said, I understand that father is dead, but I can't see why he does not come home to supper. Further material relating to this subject will be found in the section Kinder Seal, edited by Frau Dr. von Hug Helmuth in Imago, volume 1-5, to 1912-18. 
being dead means, for the child, who has been spared the sight of the suffering that precedes death, much the same as being gone and ceasing to annoy the survivors. The child does not distinguish the means by which this absence is brought about, whether by distance or estrangement or death. If, during the child's prehistoric years, a nurse was being dismissed, and if his mother dies a while later, the two experiences, as we discover by analysis, form links of a chain in his memory. The fact that the child does not very intensely miss those who are absent has been realised, to her sorrow, by many a mother. When she has returned home from an absence of several weeks and has been told upon inquiry, the children have not asked for their mother once. But if she really departs for that undiscovered country from whose born no traveller returns, the children seem at first to have forgotten her, and only subsequently do they begin to remember their dead mother. The observation of a father trained in psychoanalysis was able to detect the very moment when his very intelligent little daughter, age four, realised the difference between being away and being dead. The child was being troublesome at table, and noted that one of the waitresses in the pension was looking at her with an expression of annoyance. Josephine ought to be dead, she thereupon remarked to her father. But why dead? asked the father soothingly. Wouldn't it be enough if she went away? No, replied the child, then she would come back again. To the uncurbed self-love, narcissism of the child, every inconvenience constitutes the crime of less majest. And as in draconian code, the child's feelings prescribe for all such crimes the one invariable punishment. While, therefore, the child has its motives for desiring the absence of another child, it is lacking in all those restraints which would prevent it from clothing this wish in the form of a death wish. And the psychic reaction to dreams of a death wish proves that, in spite of all the differences of content, the wish in the case of the child is, after all, identical with the corresponding wish of an adult. If, then, the death wish of a child in respect of his brothers and sisters is explained by his childish egoism, which makes him regard his brothers and sisters as rivals, how are we to account for the same wish in respect of his parents, who bestow their love on him and satisfy his needs, and whose preservation he ought to desire for these very egoistical reasons? Towards a solution of this difficulty, we may be guided by our knowledge that the very great majority of dreams of the death of a parent refer to the parent of the same sex as the dreamer, so that a man generally dreams of the death of his father, and a woman of the death of her mother. I do not claim that this happens constantly, but that it happens in a great majority of cases is so evident that it requires explanation by some factor of general significance. Broadly speaking, it is as though a sexual preference made itself felt at an early age, as though the boy regarded his father and the girl her mother as a rival in love, by whose removal he or she could but profit. The situation is frequently disguised by the intervention of a tendency to punishment, which, in the form of a moral reaction, threatens the loss of the beloved parent. Before rejecting this idea as monstrous, let the reader again consider the actual relations between parents and children. We must distinguish between the traditional standard of conduct, the filial piety expected in this relation, and what daily observation shows us to be the fact. More than one occasion for enmity lies hidden amongst the relations of parents and children, Conditions are present in the greatest abundance under which wishes cannot pass the censorship are bound to arise. Let us first consider the relation between father and son. In my opinion, the sanctity with which we have endorsed the injunctions of the Decalogue dulls our perception of the reality. Perhaps we hardly dare permit ourselves to perceive that the greater part of humanity neglects to obey the fifth commandment. In the lowest as well as the highest strata of human society, filial piety towards parents is wont to recede before other interests. 
the obscure legends which have been handed down to us from the primeval ages of human society in mythology and folklore give a deplorable idea of the despotic power of the father and the ruthlessness with which it was exercised. Kronos devours his children as the wild boar devours the litter of the sow. Zeus emasculates his father and takes his place as ruler. The more tyrannically the father ruled in the ancient family, the more surely must the son, as his appointed successor, have assumed the position of an enemy, and the greater must have been his impatience to attain to supremacy through the death of his father. Even in our own middle-class families, the father commonly fosters the growth of the germ of hatred, which is naturally inherent in the paternal relation by refusing to allow the son to be a free agent, or by denying him the means of becoming so. A physician often has occasion to remark that a son's grief at the loss of his father cannot quench his gratification that he has at last obtained his freedom. Fathers, as a rule, cling desperately to as much of the sadly antiquated potestas patris familias as still survives in our modern society. And the poet who, like Ibsen, puts the immemorial strife between father and son in the foreground of his drama, is sure of his effect. The causes of conflict between mother and daughter arise when the daughter grows up and finds herself watched by her mother when she longs for real sexual freedom, while the mother is reminded by the budding beauty of her daughter that for her the time has come to renounce sexual claims. All these circumstances are obvious to everyone, but they do not help us to explain dreams of the death of their parents in persons for whom filial piety has long since come to be unquestionable. We are, however, prepared by the foregoing discussion to look for the origin of a death wish in the earliest years of childhood. In the case of psychoneurotics, Analysis confirms this conjecture beyond all doubt, for analysis tells us that the sexual wishes of the child, insofar as they deserve this designation in their nascent state, awaken at a very early age, and that the earliest affection of the girl child is lavished on the father, while the earliest infantile desires of the boy are directed upon the mother. For the boy, the father, and for the girl, the mother, becomes an obnoxious rival, and we have already shown, in the case of brothers and sisters, how readily in children this feeling leads to the death wish. As a general rule, sexual selection soon makes its appearance in the parents. It is a natural tendency for the father to spoil his little daughters, and for the mother to take the part of the sons while both, so long as the glamour of sex does not prejudice their judgment, are strict in training the children. The child is perfectly conscious of this partiality, and offers resistance to the parent who opposes it. To find love in an adult is for the child not merely the satisfaction of a special need, it means also that the child's will is indulged in all other respects. Thus the child is obeying its own sexual instinct, and at the same time reinforcing the stimulus, proceeding from the parents, when its choice between the parents corresponds with their own. The signs of these infantile tendencies are for the most part overlooked, and yet some of them may be observed even after the early years of childhood. An eight-year-old girl of my acquaintance, whenever her mother is called away from the table, takes advantage of her absence to proclaim herself her successor. Now I shall be mamma. Carl, do you want some more vegetables? Have some more, do, etc. A particularly clever and lively little girl, not yet four years of age, in whom this trait of child psychology is unusually transparent, says frankly, now mummy can go away, then daddy must marry me and I will be his wife. Nor does this wish by any means exclude the possibility that the child may most tenderly love its mother. If the little boy is allowed to sleep at his mother's side whenever his father goes on a journey, and if after his father's return he has to go back to the nursery, 
to a person whom he likes far less, the wish may readily arise that his father might always be absent, so that he might keep his place beside his dear, beautiful mamma, and the father's death is obviously a means for the attainment of this wish. For the child's experience has taught him that dead folks, like Grandpapa, for example, are always absent, they never come back. While such observations of young children readily accommodate themselves to the interpretation suggested, they do not, it is true, carry the complete conviction which is forced upon a physician by the psychoanalysis of adult neurotics. The dreams of neurotic patients are communicated with preliminaries of such a nature that their interpretation as wish dreams becomes inevitable. One day I find a lady depressed and weeping. She says, I do not want to see my relatives any more. They must shudder at me. Thereupon, almost without any transition, she tells me that she has remembered a dream, whose significance, of course, she does not understand. She dreamed it was when she was four years old, and it was this. A fox or a lynx is walking about the roof, then something falls down, or she falls down, and after that her mother is carried out of the house, dead, whereat the dreamer weeps bitterly. I have no sooner informed her that this dream must signify a childish wish to see her mother dead, and that it is because of this dream that she thinks that her relatives must shudder at her, than she furnishes material in explanation of the dream. Link's eye is an opprobious epithet which a street boy once bestowed on her when she was a very small child, and when she was three years old a brick or tile fell on her mother's head so that she bled profusely. End of section 21 Recording by Tony Hall, Cumbria Section 22 of The Interpretation of Dreams This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Tony Hall the Interpretation of Dreams by Sigmund Freud Translated by A. A. Brill, Section 22 I once had occasion to make a thorough study of a young girl who was passing through various psychic states. In the state of frenzied confusion with which her illness began, the patient manifested a quite peculiar aversion for her mother. She struck her and abused her whenever she approached the bed, while at the same period she was affectionate and submissive to a much older sister. Then there followed a lucid but rather apathetic condition with badly disturbed sleep. It was in this phase that I began to treat her and to analyse her dreams. An enormous number of these dealt, in a more or less veiled fashion, with the death of the girl's mother. Now she was present at the funeral of an old woman, now she saw herself and her sister sitting at a table dressed in mourning. The meaning of the dreams could not be doubted. During her progressive improvement, hysterical phobias made their appearance, the most distressing of which was the fear that something had happened to her mother. Wherever she might be at the time, she had then to hurry home in order to convince herself that her mother was still alive. Now this case, considered in conjunction with the rest of my experience, was very instructive, it showed, in polyglot translations, as it were, the different ways in which the psychic apparatus reacts to the same exciting idea. In the state of confusion, which I regard as an overthrow of a second psychic instance by the first instance, at other times suppressed, the unconscious enmity towards the mother gained the upper hand and found physical expression. Then, when the patient became calmer, the insurrection was suppressed and the domination of the censorship restored, and this enmity had access only to the realms of dreams, in which it realised the wish that the mother might die, and, after the normal condition had still further strengthened, it created the excessive concern for the mother as a hysterical counter-reaction and defensive phenomenon. In the light of these considerations, it is no longer inexplicable why hysterical girls are so often extravagantly attached to their mothers. 
On another occasion, I had an opportunity of obtaining a profound insight into the unconscious psychic life of a young man for whom an obsession or neurosis made life almost unendurable, so that he could not go into the streets because he was tormented by the fear that he would kill everyone he met. He spent his days in contriving evidence of an alibi in case he should be accused of any murder that might have been committed in the city. It goes without saying that this man was as moral as he was highly cultured. The analysis, which, by the way, led to a cure, revealed as the basis of this distressing obsession murderous impulses in respect of his rather over-strict father, impulses which, to his astonishment, had consciously expressed themselves when he was seven years old, but which, of course, had originated in a much earlier period of his childhood. After the painful illness and death of his father, when the young man was in his thirty-first year, the obsessive reproach made its appearance, which transferred itself to strangers in the form of this phobia. Anyone capable of wishing to push his own father from a mountain top into an abyss cannot be trusted to spare the lives of persons less closely related to him. He therefore does well to lock himself into his room. According to my already extensive experience, parents play a leading part in the infantile psychology of all persons who subsequently become psychoneurotics. Falling in love with one parent and hating the other forms part of the permanent stock of the psychic impulses which arise in early childhood and are of such importance as the material of the subsequent neurosis but I do not believe that psychoneurotics are to be sharply distinguished in this respect from other persons who remain normal. That is, I do not believe that they are capable of creating something absolutely new and peculiar to themselves. It is far more probable, and this is confirmed by incidental observations of normal children, that in their amorous or hostile attitude towards their parents, psychoneurotics do no more than reveal to us by magnification, something that occurs less markedly and intensively in the minds of the majority of children. Antiquity has furnished us with legendary matter which corroborates this belief, and the profound and universal validity of the old legends is explicable only by an equally universal validity of the above-mentioned hypothesis of infantile psychology. I am referring to the legend of King Oedipus and the Oedipus Rex of Sophocles. Oedipus, the son of Laius, king of Thebes and Jocasta, is exposed as a suckling because an oracle had informed the father that his son, who was still unborn, would be his murderer. He is rescued and grows up as a king's son at a foreign court, until, being uncertain of his origin, he too consults the oracle and is warned to avoid his native place, for he is destined to become the murderer of his father and the husband of his mother. On the road leading away from his supposed home, he meets King Laius, and in a sudden quarrel strikes him dead. He comes to Thebes, where he solves the riddle of the Sphinx, who is barring the way to the city, whereupon he is elected king by the grateful Thebans, and is rewarded with the hand of Jocasta. He reigns for many years in peace and honour, and begets two sons and two daughters upon his unknown mother, until at last a plague breaks out, which causes the Thebians to consult the oracle anew. Here Sophocles' tragedy begins. The messengers bring the reply that the plague will stop as soon as the murderer of Laius is driven from the country, but where is he? Where shall he be found? Faint and hard to be known, the trace of the ancient guilt? The action of the play consists simply in the disclosure, approached step by step and artistically delayed, and comparable to the work of a psychoanalysis, that Oedipus himself is the murderer of Laius, and that he is the son of the murdered man and Jocasta. Shocked by the abominable crime which he has unwittingly committed, Oedipus blinds himself and departs from his native city. The prophecy of the oracle has been fulfilled. The Oedipus Rex is a tragedy of fate. Its tragic effect depends on the conflict between the all-powerful will of the gods 
and the vain efforts of human beings threatened with disaster. Resignation to the divine will and the perception of one's own impotence is the lesson which the deeply moved spectator is supposed to learn from the tragedy. Modern authors have therefore sought to achieve a similar tragic effect by expressing the same conflict in stories of their own invention. But the playgoers have looked on unmoved at the unavailing efforts of guiltless men to avert the fulfilment of course or oracle. The modern tragedies of destiny have failed in their effect. If the Oedipus Rex is capable of moving a modern reader or playgoer no less powerfully than it moved the contemporary Greeks, the only possible explanation is that the effect of the Greek tragedy does not depend upon the conflict between fate and human will, but upon the peculiar nature of the material by which this conflict is revealed. There must be a voice within us which is prepared to acknowledge the compelling power of fate in the Oedipus, while we are able to condemn the situations occurring in Di Onfra or other tragedies of fate as arbitrary inventions. And there actually is a motive in the story of King Oedipus, which explains the verdict of this inner voice. His fate moves us only because it might have been our own, because the oracle laid upon us before our birth the very curse which rested upon him. It may be that we were all destined to direct our first sexual impulses towards our mothers, and our first impulses of hatred and violence toward our fathers. Our dreams convince us that we were. King Oedipus, who slew his father Laius and wedded his mother Jocasta, is nothing more or less than a wish fulfilment, the fulfilment of the wish of our childhood. But we, more fortunate than he, in so far as we have not become psychoneurotics, have since our childhood succeeded in withdrawing our sexual impulses from our mothers and in forgetting our jealousy of our fathers. We recoil from the person for whom this primitive wish of our childhood has been fulfilled with all the force of the repression which these wishes have undergone in our minds since childhood. As the poet brings the guilt of Oedipus to light by his investigation, he forces us to become aware of our own inner selves, in which the same impulses are still extant, even though they are suppressed. The antithesis with which the chorus departs. Behold, this is Oedipus, who unravelled the great riddle and was first in power, whose fortune of the townsmen praised and envied. See in what dreaded adversity he sank. This admonition touches us and our own pride, we who, since the years of our childhood, have grown so wise and so powerful in our own estimation. Like Oedipus, we live in ignorance of the desires that offend morality, the desires that nature has forced upon us, and after their unveiling, we may well prefer to avert our gaze from the scenes of our childhood. In the very text of Sophocles' tragedy, there is an unmistakable reference to the fact that the Oedipus legend had its source in dream material of immemorial antiquity, the content of which was the painful disturbance of the child's relations to its parents, caused by the first impulses of sexuality. Jocasta comforts Oedipus, who is not yet enlightened, but is troubled by the recollection of the oracle, by an allusion to a dream which is often dreamed, though it cannot, in her opinion, mean anything. For many a man hath seen himself in dreams his mother's mate, but he who gives no heed to such matters bears the easier life. The dream of having sexual intercourse with one's mother was as common then as it is today with many people, who tell it with indignation and astonishment. As may well be imagined, it is the key to the tragedy and the complement to the dream of the death of the father. The Oedipus fable is the reaction of fantasy to these two typical dreams, and just as such a dream, when occurring to an adult, is experienced with feelings of aversion, so the content of the fable must include terror and self-chastisement. 
The form which it subsequently assumed was the result of an uncomprehending secondary elaboration of the material, which sought to make it serve a theological intention. Another of the great poetic tragedies, Shakespeare's Hamlet, is rooted in the same soil as Oedipus Rex. But the whole difference in the psychic life of the two, widely separated periods of civilization, and the progress during the course of time of repression in the emotional life of humanity, is manifested in the differing treatment of the same material. In Oedipus Rex, the basic wish fantasy of the child is brought to light and realised as it is in dreams. In Hamlet it remains repressed, and we learn of its existence, as we discover the relevant facts in a neurosis, only through the inhibitory effects which proceed from it. In the more modern drama, the curious fact that it is possible to remain in complete uncertainty as to the character of the hero has proved to be quite consistent with the overpowering effect of the tragedy. The play is based upon Hamlet's hesitation in accomplishing the task of revenge assigned to him. The text does not give the cause or the motive of this hesitation, nor have the manifold attempts at interpretation succeeded in doing so. According to the still prevailing conception, a conception for which Goeth was first responsible, Hamlet represents the type of man whose active energy is paralysed by excessive intellectual activity. Sicklied o'er with the pale cast of thought. According to another conception, the poet has endeavoured to portray a morbid, irresolute character on the verge of neurasthenia. The plot of the drama, however, shows us that Hamlet is by no means intended to appear as a character wholly incapable of action. On two separate occasions we see him assert himself, once in a sudden outburst of rage, when he stabs the eavesdropper behind the arras, and on the other occasion when he deliberately, and even craftily, with the complete unscrupulousness of a prince of the Renaissance, sends the two courtiers to death, which was intended for himself. What is it then that inhibits him in accomplishing the task which his father's ghost has laid upon him? Here the explanation offers itself that it is the peculiar nature of this task. Hamlet is able to do anything but take vengeance upon the man who did away with his father and has taken his father's place with his mother. The man who shows him in realisation the repressed desires of his own childhood. The loathing which should have driven him to revenge is thus replaced by self-reproach, by conscientious scruples, which tell him that he himself is no better than the murderer whom he is required to punish. I have here translated into consciousness what had to remain unconscious in the mind of the hero. If anyone wishes to call Hamlet an hysterical subject, I cannot but admit that this is the deduction to be drawn from my interpretation. The sexual aversion which Hamlet expresses in conversation with Ophelia is perfectly consistent with this deduction. The same sexual aversion which during the first few years was increasingly to take possession of the poet's soul until it found its supreme utterance in Timon of Athens. It can, of course, be only the poet's own psychology with which we are confronted in Hamlet. And in a work on Shakespeare by George Brandes, 1896, I find the statement that the drama was composed immediately after the death of Shakespeare's father, 1601, that is to say, when he was still mourning his loss, and during a revival, as we may fairly assume, of his own childish feelings in respect of his father. It is known, too, that Shakespeare's son, who died in childhood, bore the name of Hamnet, identical with Hamlet. Just as Hamlet treats of the relation of the son to his parents, so Macbeth, which was written about the same period, is based upon the theme of childlessness. Just as all neurotic symptoms, like dreams themselves, are capable of hyperinterpretation, and even require such hyperinterpretation before they become perfectly intelligible, so every genuine poetical creation must have proceeded from more than one motive 
more than one impulse in the mind of the poet, and must admit of more than one interpretation. I have here attempted to interpret only the deeper stratum of impulses in the mind of the creative poet. With regard to typical dreams of the death of relatives, I must add a few words upon their significance from the point of view of the theory of dreams in general. These dreams show us the occurrence of a very unusual state of things. They show us that the dream thought created by the repressed wish completely escapes the censorship and is transferred to the dream without alteration. Special conditions must obtain in order to make this possible. The following two factors favour the production of these dreams. First, this is the last wish that we could credit ourselves with harbouring. We believe such a wish would never occur to us even in a dream. The dream censorship is therefore unprepared for this monstrosity, just as the laws of Solon did not foresee the necessity of establishing a penalty for patricide. Secondly, the repressed and unsuspected wish is, in the special case, frequently met halfway by a residue from the day's experience in the form of some concern for the life of the beloved person. This anxiety cannot enter into the dream otherwise than by taking advantage of the corresponding wish. But the wish is able to mask itself behind the concern which has been aroused during the day. If one is inclined to think that all this is really a much simpler process and to imagine that one merely continues during the night and in one's dream what was begun during the day, one removes the dreams of the death of those dear to us out of all connection with the general explanation of dreams, and a problem that may very well be solved remains a problem needlessly. It is instructive to trace the relation of these dreams to anxiety dreams. In dreams of the death of those dear to us, the repressed wish has found a way of avoiding the censorship, and the distortion for which the censorship is responsible. An invariable concomitant phenomenon, then, is that painful emotions are felt in the dream. Similarly, an anxiety dream occurs only when the censorship is entirely or partially overpowered. And, on the other hand, the overpowering of the censorship is facilitated when the actual sensation of anxiety is already present from somatic sources. It thus becomes obvious for what purpose the censorship performs its office and practices dream distortion. It does so in order to prevent the development of anxiety and other forms of painful effect. I have spoken in the foregoing sections of the egoism of the child's psyche, and I now emphasise this peculiarity in order to suggest a connection, for dreams too have retained this characteristic. All dreams are absolutely egoistical. In every dream the beloved ego appears, even though in a disguised form. The wishes that are realised in dreams are invariably the wishes of this ego. It is only a deceptive appearance if interest in another person is believed to have evoked a dream. I will now analyse a few examples which appear to contradict this assertion. 1. A boy not yet four years of age relates the following dream. He saw a large garnished dish on which was a large joint of roast meat. And the joint was suddenly not carved but eaten up. He did not see the person who ate it. As we know, the neurotic also is inclined to immoderation and excess. Who can he be, this strange person, of whose luxurious repast the little fellow dreams? The experience of the day must supply the answer. For some days past, the boy, in accordance with the doctor's orders, had been living on a milk diet. But on the evening of the dream day, he had been naughty and, as a punishment, had been deprived of his supper. He had already undergone one such hunger cure, and had borne his deprivation bravely. He knew that he would get nothing, but he did not even allude to the fact that he was hungry. Training was beginning to produce its effect. This is demonstrated even by the dream, which reveals the beginnings of dream distortion. There is no doubt that he himself is the person whose desires are directed toward this abundant meal and a meal of roast meat at that. 
But since he knows that this is forbidden him, he does not dare, as hungry children do in dreams, to sit down to the meal himself. The person remains anonymous. Number two. One night I dream that I see on a bookseller's counter a new volume of one of those collector's series, which I am in the habit of buying. Monographs on artistic subjects, history, famous artistic centres, etc. The new collection is entitled Famous Orators, or Orations, and the first number bears the name of Dr. Letcher. On analysis, it seems to me improbable that the fame of Dr. Letcher the long-winded speaker of the German opposition, should occupy my thoughts while I am dreaming. The fact is that a few days ago I undertook the psychological treatment of some new patients and am now forced to talk for 10 to 12 hours a day. Thus I myself am a long-winded speaker. Number three. On another occasion I dream that a university lecturer of my acquaintance says to me, my son, the myopic, then follows a dialogue of brief observation and replies. A third portion of the dream follows, in which I and my sons appear, and so far as the latent dream content is concerned, the father, the son and Professor M are merely lay figures, representing myself and my eldest son. Later on I shall examine this dream again, on account of another peculiarity. Number four. The following dream gives an example of really base egoistical feelings which conceal themselves behind an affectionate concern. My friend Otto looks ill. His face is brown and his eyes protrude. Otto is my family physician to whom I owe a debt greater than I can ever hope to repay since he has watched for years over the health of my children, has treated them successfully when they have been ill and, moreover, has given them presents whenever he could find any excuse for doing so. He paid us a visit on the day of the dream, and my wife noticed that he looked tired and exhausted. At night I dream of him, and my dream attributes to him certain of the symptoms of Bastow's disease. If you were to disregard my rules for dream interpretation, you would understand this dream to mean that I am concerned about the health of my friend and that this concern is realised in the dream. It would thus constitute a contradiction not only of the assertion that a dream is a wish fulfilment but also of the assertion that it is acceptable only to egoistical impulses. But will those who thus interpret my dream explain why I should fear that Otto has Bastow's disease for which diagnosis his appearance does not afford the slightest justification? My analysis, on the other hand, furnishes the following material, deriving from an incident which had occurred six years earlier. We were driving, a small party of us, including Professor R, in the dark through the forest of N, which lies at a distance of some hours from where we were staying in the country. The driver, who was not quite sober, overthrew us and the carriage down a bank, and it was only by good fortune that we all escaped unhurt. But we were forced to spend the night at the nearest inn, where the news of our mishap aroused great sympathy. A certain gentleman who showed unmistakable symptoms of morbus base dowi, the brownish colour of the skin of the face and the protruding eyes, but no goiter, placed himself entirely at our disposal, and asked what he could do for us. Professor R answered in his decisive way, nothing except lend me a nightshirt, whereupon our generous friend replied, I am sorry but I cannot do that, and left us. In continuing the analysis, it occurs to me that Bastow is the name not only of a physician, but also of a famous pedagogue. Now that I am wide awake, I do not feel quite sure of this fact. My friend Otto is the person whom I have asked to take charge of the physical education of my children, especially during the age of puberty, hence the nightshirt, in case anything should happen to me. By seeing Otto in my dream with the morbid symptoms of our above-mentioned generous helper, I clearly mean to say, if anything happens to me, he will do just as little for my children as Baron L did for us, in spite of his amiable offers. 
the egoistical flavour of this dream should now be obvious enough. But where is the wish fulfilment to be found in this? Not in the vengeance wreaked on my friend Otto, who seems to be fated to be badly treated in my dreams, but in the following circumstance. Inasmuch as in my dream I represented Otto as Baronel, I likewise identified myself with another person, namely with Professor R. For I have asked something of Otto, just as R asked something of Baronel at the time of the incident I have described. And this is the point, for Professor R has gone his way independently, outside academic circles, just as I myself have done, and has only in his later years received the title which he had earned before. Once more, then, I want to be a professor. The very phrase in his later years is a wish fulfilment, for it means that I shall live long enough to steer my boys through the age of puberty myself. End of section 22 Recording by Tony Hall, Cumbria Section 23 of The Interpretation of Dreams This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by The Bobby Lee The Interpretation of Dreams by Sigmund Freud Translated by A. A. Brill Section 22 Typical Dreams Other Types Of other typical dreams in which one flies with a feeling of ease or falls in terror, I know nothing from my own experience, and whatever I have to say about them I owe to my psychoanalysis. From the information thus obtained, one must conclude that these dreams also reproduce impressions made in childhood, that is, that they refer to the games involving rapid motion, which have such an extraordinary attraction for children. Whereas the uncle who has never made a child fly by running with it across the room with outstretched arms, or has never played at falling with it by rocking it on his knee and then suddenly straightening his leg, or by lifting it above his head and suddenly pretending to withdraw his supporting hand. At such moments, children shout with joy and insatiably demand a repetition of the performance, especially if a little fright and dizziness are involved in the game. In after years, they repeat their sensations in dreams, but in dreams they omit the hand that held them, so that now they are free to float or fall. We know that all the small children have a fondness for such games as rocking and seesawing, and if they see gymnastic performances at the circus, the recollection of such games is refreshed. In some boys, a hysterical attack will consist simply in the reproduction of such performances, which they accomplish with great dexterity. Not infrequently, sexual sensations are excited by these games of movement, which are quite neutral in themselves. To express the matter in a few words, the exciting games of childhood are repeated in dreams of flying, falling, reeling, and the like but the voluptuous feelings are not transformed into anxiety. But as every mother knows, the excited play of children often enough culminates in quarreling and tears. Psychoanalytic investigation has enabled us to conclude that in the predilection shown by children for gymnastic performances and in the repetition of these in hysterical attacks, there is besides the pleasure felt in the organ. Yet another factor at work of an unconscious, namely a memory picture of sexual intercourse observed in human beings or animals. A young colleague who is entirely free from nervousness tells me, in this connection, I know from my own experience that while swinging and at the moment at which the downward movement was at its maximum, I used to have a curious feeling in my genitals, which although it was not really pleasing to me, I must describe it as a voluptuous feeling. I have often heard from patients that the first erections with voluptuous sensations which they can remember to have had in boyhood occurred while they were climbing. It is established with complete certainty by psychoanalysis that the first sexual sensations often have their origin in the scufflings and wrestlings of childhood. I have therefore good reason for rejecting the explanation that it is the state of our dermal sensations during sleep 
the sensation of the movements of the limes, etc., that evokes dreams of flying and falling. I see that these very sensations have been reproduced from the memory to which the dream refers, and that they are therefore dream content and not dream sources. I do not for a moment deny, however, that I am unable to furnish a full explanation of this series of typical dreams. Precisely, here my material leaves me in the lurch. I must add here to the general opinion that all the dermal and kinetic sensations of these typical dreams are awakened as soon as any psychic motive of whatever kind has need of them, and that they are neglected when there is no such need of them. The relation to infantile experiences seems to be confirmed by the indications which I have obtained from the analysis of psychoneurotics, but I am unable to say what other meanings might, in the course of the dreamer's life, have become attached to the memory of these sensations, different perhaps in each individual, despite the typical appearance of these dreams, and I should very much like to be in a position to fill this gap with careful analysis of good examples. To those who wonder why I complain of lack of material despite the frequency of these dreams of flying, falling, tooth drying, etc., I must explain that I myself have never experienced any such dreams since I have turned my attention to the subject of dream interpretation. The dreams of narratives, which are at my disposal, however, are not all capable of interpretation and very often it is impossible to penetrate to the farthest point of their hidden intention. A certain psychic force which participated in the building up of these neurosis, and which again becomes active during its dissolution, opposes interpretation of the final problem. End of section 23 Recording by The Bobby Lee Section 24 of the Interpretation of Dreams This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by The Bobby Lee The Interpretation of Dreams by Sigmund Freud Translated by A. A. Brill Section 23 Typical dreams. The examination dream. Everyone who has received his certificate of matriculation after passing his final examination at the school complains of the persistence with which he is plagued by anxiety dreams in which he has failed or must go through his course again, etc. For the holder of a university degree, this typical dream is replaced by another, which represents that he has not taken his doctor's degree, to which he vainly objects, while still asleep, that he has already been practicing for years, or is already a university lecturer, or the senior partner of a firm of lawyers, and so on. These are the ineradicable memories of the punishments we suffered as children for misdeeds which we had committed, memories which were revived in us on the dies irae, dies illa of the grueling examination at the two critical junctures in our careers as students. The examination anxiety of neurotics is likewise intensified by this childish fear. When our student days are over, it's no longer our parents or teachers who see to our punishment. The inexorable chain of cause and effect of later life has taken over our further education. Now we dream of our matriculation or the examination for the doctor's degree, and who has not been faint-hearted on such occasions? Whenever we fear that we may be punished by some unpleasant result because we have done something carelessly or wrongly, because we have not been as thorough as we might have been, in short, whenever we feel the burden of responsibility. For a further explanation of examination dreams, I have to thank a remark made by a colleague who has studied this subject, who once stated in the course of a scientific discussion that in his experience the examination dream occurred only to persons who had passed the examination, never to those who had flunked. We have had increasing confirmation of the fact 
that the anxiety dream of examination occurs when the dreamer is anticipating a responsible task on the following day with the possibility of disgrace. Recourse will then be had to an occasion in the past on which a great anxiety proved to have been without real justification, having indeed been refuted by the outcome. Such a dream would be a very striking example of the way in which the dream content is misunderstood by the waking instance, the exclamation which is regarded as a protest against the dream, but I am only the doctor, etc., would in reality be the consolation offered by the dream, and should therefore be worded as follows. Do not be afraid of the morrow. Think of the anxiety which you felt before your matriculation. Yet nothing happened to justify it, for now you are a doctor, etc. But the anxiety which you attribute to the dream really has its origin in the residues of the dream day. The tests of this interpretation which I have been able to make in my own case and in that of others, although by no means exhaustive, were entirely in its favor. For example, I failed in my examination for the doctor's degree in medical jurisprudence. Never once has the matter worried me in my dreams, while I have often enough been examined in botany, zoology, and chemistry, and I sat for the examinations in these subjects with well-justified anxiety, but escaped disaster through the clemency of fate or of the examiner. In my dreams of school examinations, I am always examined in history, a subject in which I passed brilliantly at the time, but only, I must admit, because of my good-natured professor. My one-eyed benefactor in another dream did not overlook the fact that on the examination paper which I returned to him, I had crossed out with my fingernail the second of three questions, as a hint that he should not insist on it. One of my patients, who withdrew before the matriculation examination only to pass it later, but failed in the officer's examination so that he did not become an officer, tells me that he often dreams of the former examination, but never of the latter. End of section 24 Recording by The Bobby Lee Section 25 of the Interpretation of Dreams This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tech Savvy The Interpretation of Dreams by Sigmund Freud Translated by A. A. Brill Section 25 The Dream Work Condensation All other previous attempts to solve the problems of dreams have concerned themselves directly with the manifest dream content as it is retained in the memory. They have sought to obtain an interpretation of the dream from this content, or if they dispensed with an interpretation to base their conclusions concerning the dream on the evidence provided by this content. We, however, are confronted by a different set of data. For us, a new psychic material interposes itself between the dream content and the results of our investigations. The latent dream content, or dream thoughts, which are obtained only by our method. We develop the solution of the dream from this latent content, and not from the manifest dream content. We are thus confronted with a new problem, an entirely novel task, that of examining and tracing the relations between the latent dream thoughts and the manifest dream content and the processes by which the later has grown out of the former. The dream thoughts and the dream content present themselves as two descriptions of the same content in two different languages. Or, to put it more clearly, the dream content appears to us as a translation of the dream thoughts into another mode of expression 
whose symbols and laws of composition we must learn by comparing the origin with the translation. The dream thoughts we can understand without further trouble the moment we have ascertained them. The dream content is, as it were, presented in hieroglyphics, whose symbols must be translated one by one into the language of the dream thoughts. It would, of course, be incorrect to attempt to read these symbols in accordance with their values as pitches, instead of in accordance with their meaning as symbols. For instance, I have before me a picture, puzzle, rebus, a house, upon whose roof there is a boat, then a single letter, then a running figure, whose head has been omitted, and so on. As a critique, I might be tempted to judge this composition and its elements to be nonsensical. A boat is out of place on the roof of a house, and a headless man cannot run. The man, too, is larger than the house. And if the whole thing is meant to represent a landscape, the single letters have no right in it, since they do not occur in nature. A correct judgment of the picture puzzle is possible only if I make no such objections to the whole and its parts, and if on the contrary I take the trouble to replace each image by syllable or word which it may represent by virtue of some allusion or relation. The words thus put together are no longer meaningless but might constitute the most beautiful and pregnant aphorism. Now a dream is such a picture puzzle, and our predecessors in the art of dream interpretation have made the mistake of judging the rebus as an artistic composition. As such, of course, it appears nonsensical and worthless. A. Condensation the first thing that becomes clear to the investigator when he compares the dream content with the dream thoughts is that a tremendous work of condensation has been accomplished. The dream is meager, paltry, and laconic in comparison with the range and copiousness of the dream thoughts. The dream, when written down, fills half a page. The analysis, which contains the dream thoughts requires six, eight, twelve times as much space. The ratio varies with different dreams, but in my experience it is always of the same order. As a rule, the extent of the compression which has been accomplished is underestimated, owing to the fact that the dream thoughts which have been brought to light are believed to be the whole of the material. Whereas a continuation of the work of interpretation would reveal still further thoughts hidden in the dream. We have already found it necessary to remark that one can never be really sure that one has interpreted a dream completely, even if the solution seems satisfying and flawless. It is always possible that yet another meaning has been manifested by the same dream. Thus, the degree of condensation is, strictly speaking, indeterminable. Exception may be taken, and at first sight the objection seems perfectly plausible, to the assertion that the disproportion between dream content and dream thoughts justifies the conclusion that a considerable condensation of psychic material occurs in the formation of dreams. For we often have the feeling that we have been dreaming a great deal all night, and have then forgotten most of what we have dreamed. The dream which we remember on waking would thus appear to be merely a remnant of the dream work, which would surely equal the dream thoughts in range if only we could remember it completely. To a certain extent this is undoubtedly true. There is no getting away from the fact that a dream is most accurately reproduced if we try to remember it immediately after waking. 
and that the recollection of it becomes more and more defective as the day goes on. On the other hand, it has to be recognized that the impression that we have dreamed a good deal more than we are able to reproduce is very often based on illusion, the origin of which we shall explain later on. Moreover, the assumption of a condensation and the dream work is not affected by the possibility of forgetting a part of dreams. For it may be demonstrated by the multitude of ideas pertaining to those individual parts of the dream which do remain in the memory. If a large part of the dream has really escaped the memory, we are probably deprived of access to a new series of dream thoughts. We have no justification for expecting that those portions of the dream which have been lost should, likewise, have referred only to those thoughts which we know from the analysis of the portions which have been preserved. In view of the very great number of ideas which analysis elicits for each individual element of the dream content, the principal doubt in the minds of many readers will be whether it is permissible to count everything that subsequently occurs to the mind during analysis as forming part of the dream thoughts. In other words, to assume that all these thoughts have been active in the sleeping state and have taken part in the formation of the dream. Is it not more probable that new combinations of thoughts are developed in the course of analysis? which did not participate in the formation of the dream. To this objection, I can give only a conditional reply. It is true, of course, that separate combinations of thoughts make their first appearance during the analysis, but one can convince oneself every time this happens that such new combinations have been established only between thoughts which have already been connected in other ways in dream thoughts. The new combinations are, so to speak, corollaries, short circuits, which are made possible by the existence of other more fundamental modes of connection. In respect of the great majority of groups of thoughts revealed by analysis, we are obliged to admit that they have already been active in the formation of the dream. For if we work through a succession of such thoughts, which at first sight seem to have played no part in the formation of the dream, we suddenly come upon a thought which occurs in the dream content and is indispensable to its interpretation, but which is nevertheless inaccessible except through this chain of thoughts. The reader may here turn to the dream of the botanical monograph, which is obviously the result of an astonishing degree of condensation. Even though I have not given the complete analysis. But how, then? are we to imagine the psychic condition of the sleeper which precedes dreaming? Do all the dream thoughts exist side by side, or do they pursue one another? Or are there several simultaneous trains of thought proceeding from different centers, which subsequently meet? I do not think it is necessary at this point to form a plastic conception of the psychic condition at the time of dream formation. But let us not forget that we are concerned with unconscious thinking, and that the process may easily be different from that which we observe in ourselves in deliberate contemplation accompanied by consciousness. The fact, however, is irrefutable that dream formation is based on a process of condensation. How, then, is this condensation affected? Now, if we consider that of the dream thoughts a certain only the most restricted number are represented in the dream by means of one of the conceptual elements, we might conclude that the condensation is accomplished by means of omission 
inasmuch as the dream is not a faithful translation or projection point by point of the dream thoughts, but a very incomplete and defective reproduction of them. This view, as we shall soon perceive, is a very inadequate one. But for the present, let us take it as a point of departure and ask ourselves, if only a few of the elements of the dream thoughts make their way into the dream content, what are the conditions that determine their selection? In order to solve this problem, let us turn our attention to those elements of the dream content which must have fulfilled the condition for which we are looking. The most suitable material for this investigation will be a dream to whose formation a particularly intense condensation has contributed. I select the dream cited in Chapter 5 of the Botanical Monograph. Dream Content I have written a monograph upon a certain indeterminate species of plant. The book lies before me. I am just turning over a folded colored plate. A dried specimen of the plant is bound up in this copy as in a herbarium. The most prominent element of this dream is the botanical monograph. This is derived from the impressions of the dream day. I had actually seen a monograph on the genus Cyclamen in a bookseller's window. The mention of these genus is lacking in the dream content. Only the monograph and its relation to botany have remained. The botanical monograph immediately reveals its relation to the work on cocaine, which I once wrote. From cocaine, the train of thought proceeds on the one hand to a fest shrift, and on the other to my friend, the occultist, Dr. Kleinstein who was partly responsible for the introduction of cocaine as a local anesthetic. Moreover, Dr. Kleinstein is connected with the recollection of an interrupted conversation I had had with him on the previous evening, and with all sorts of ideas relating to the remuneration of the medical and surgical services among colleagues. This conversation, then, is the actual dream stimulus. The monograph on a cyclamen is also a real incident, but one of an indifferent nature. As I now see, the botanical monograph of the dream proves to be a more common mean between the two experiences of the day, taken over unchanged from an indifferent impression, and bound with the physically significant experience by means of the most copious associations. Not only the combined idea of the botanical monograph, however, but also each of its separate elements, botanical and monograph, penetrates farther and farther by manifold associations into the confused tangle of the dream thoughts. To botanical belong the recollections of the person of Professor Gartner, German Gartner is equivalent to Gardner, of his blooming wife, of my patient, whose name is Flora, and of a lady concerning whom I told the story of the forgotten flowers. Gartner again leads me to the laboratory, and the conversation with Kleinstein and the allusion to the two female patients belongs to the same conversation. From the lady with the flowers a train of thoughts branches off to the favorite flowers of my wife, whose other branch leads to the title of the hastily seen monograph. Further, botanical recalls an episode at the gymnasium and a university examination and a fresh subject, that of my hobbies, which was broached in the above-mentioned conversation, is linked up by means of what is humorously called my favorite flower, the artichoke, with the train of thoughts proceeding from the forgotten flowers, 
behind artichoke there lies on the one hand a recollection of italy and on the other a reminiscence of a scene of my childhood in which i first formed an acquaintance which has since then grown so intimate with books botanical then is a veritable nucleus and for the dream the meeting point of many trains of thought which i can testify had all really been brought into connection by the conversation referred to here we find ourselves in a thought factory in which as in the weaver's masterpiece the little shuttles to and fro fly and the threads unnoted flow one throw links up a thousand threads monograph in the dream again touches two themes the one-sided nature of my studies and the costliness of my hobbies the impression derived from this first investigation is that the elements botanical and monograph were taken up into the dream content because they were able to offer the most numerous points of contact with the greatest number of dream thoughts and thus represented nodal points at which a great number of the dream thoughts met together and because they were of manifold significance in respect of the meaning of the dream the fact upon which this explanation is based may be expressed in another form every element of the dream content proves to be over determined that is it appears several times over in the dream thoughts we shall learn more if we examine the other components of the dream in respect of their occurrence in the dream thoughts the colored plate refers cf the analysis in chapter five to a new subject the criticism passed upon my work by colleagues and also to a subject already represented in the dream my hobbies and further to a memory of my childhood in which i pull to pieces a book with colored plates the dried specimen of the plant relates to my experience with the herbarium at the gymnasium and gives this memory particular emphasis thus i perceive the nature of the relation between the dream content and the dream thoughts not only are the elements of the dream determined several times over by the dream thoughts but the individual dream thoughts are represented in the dream by several elements starting from an element of the dream the path of the association leads to a number of dream thoughts and from a single dream thought to several elements of the dream in the process of dream formation therefore it is not the case that a single dream thought or a group of dream thoughts supplies the dream content with an abbreviation of itself as its representative and that the next dream thought supplies another abbreviation as its representative much as representatives are elected from among the population but rather that the whole mass of the dream thoughts is subjected to a certain elaboration in the course of which those elements that receive the strongest and completest support stand out in relief so that the process might perhaps be likened to election by the scrutin du list whatever dream i may subject to such a dissection i always find the same fundamental principle confirmed that the dream elements have been formed out of the whole mass of the dream thoughts and that every one of them appears in relation to the dream thoughts to have a multiple determination it is certainly not superfluous to demonstrate this relation of the dream content to the dream thoughts by means of a further example which is distinguished by a particularly artful intertwining of reciprocal relations the dream is that of a patient whom i am treating for claustrophobia 
fear of enclosed spaces. It will soon become evident why I feel myself called upon to entitle this exceptionally clever piece of dream activity. End of section 25「Section 26 of The Interpretation of Dreams」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Interpretation of Dreams by Sigmund Freud Translated by A. A. Brill Section 26 A Beautiful Dream the dreamer is driving with a great number of companions in the X street, where there is a modest hostelry, which is not the case. A theatrical performance is being given in one of the rooms of the inn. He is first spectator, then actor. Finally, the company is told to change their clothes in order to return to the city. Some of the company are shown to the rooms on the ground floor, others to the room on the first floor. Then a dispute arises. The people upstairs are annoyed because those downstairs have not yet finished changing, so that they cannot come down. His brother is upstairs, he is downstairs, and he is angry with his brother because they are so hurried, this part obscure. Besides, it was already decided upon their arrival who was to go upstairs and who down. Then he goes alone up the hill towards the city, and he walks so heavily and with such difficulty that he cannot move from the spot. An elderly gentleman joins him and talks angrily of the king of Italy. Finally, towards the top of the hill, he is able to walk much more easily. The difficulty experienced in climbing the hill was so distinct that for some time after waking, he was in doubt whether the experience was a dream or the reality. Judged by the manifest content, this dream can hardly be eulogized. Contrary to the rules, I shall begin the interpretation with that portion to which the dreamer referred as being the most distinct. The difficulty dreamed of and probably experienced during the dream difficulty in climbing, accompanied by the dysponia, was one of the symptoms which the patient had actually exhibited some years before, and which, in conjunction with other symptoms, was at the time attributed to tuberculosis, probably strictly simulated. From our study of the exhibition dreams, we are already acquainted with this sensation of being inhibited in motion, peculiar to dreams, and here again we find it utilized as material always available for the purpose of any other kind of representation. The part of the dream content which represents climbing as difficult at first, uneasy at the top of the hill, made me think, while it was being related, of the well-known masterly introduction of Dodd Sappho. Here, a young man carries the woman he loves upstairs. She is at first as light as a feather, but the higher he climbs, the more she waves. And this scene is symbolic of the process of their relation, in describing which, Dodd seeks to admonish young men not to lavish an earnest affection upon girls of humble origin and dubious antecedents. Although I knew that my patient had recently had a love affair with an actress and had broken it off, I hardly expected to find the interpretation which occurred to me as correct. The situation in Sappho is actually the reverse of that in the dream. For in the dream, climbing was difficult at first and easy later on. In the novel, the symbolism is pertinent only if what was at first easily carried finally proves to be a heavy burden. To my astonishment, the patient remarked that the interpretation fitted in very well with the plot of a play which he had seen in the previous evening. The play was called Rundum Vain, Round About Vienna, and treated of the career of a girl who was at first respectable, but who subsequently lapsed into the demi monde and formed relations with the highly placed lovers, thereby climbing, but finally she went downhill faster and faster. This play reminded him of another, entitled Fons Dufer, Sus Dufer, From Step to Step, the poster advertising which depicted a flight of stairs. To continue the interpretation, the actress with whom he had had his most recent and complicated affair had lived in X Street. There is no inn in the street. However, while he was spending part of the summer in Vienna for the sake of this lady, he had lodged German Amstigen, 
meaning stopped, literally stepped off, at a small hotel in the neighborhood. When he was leaving the hotel, he asked the cab driver, I am glad at all events that I didn't get any vermin here. Incidentally, the dread of the vermin is one of his phobias. Whereupon the cab driver answered, How could anybody stop there? That isn't a hotel at all. It's really nothing but a pub. The pub immediately reminded him of a quotation of a wonderful host. I was lately a guest. The host in the poem by Holland is an apple tree. Now, a second quotation continues the train of thought. Faust, dancing with a young witch, a lovely dream once came to me. I can behold an apple tree, and there two fast apples shone. They lured me so I climbed thereon. The fair one. Apples have been desired by you since first in paradise they grew, and I am moved with joy to know that such within my garden grow. There is not the slightest doubt what is meant by the apple tree and the apples. A beautiful bosom stood high among the charms by which the actress had bewitched our dreamer. Judging by the context of the analysis, we had every reason to assume that the dream referred to an impression of the dreamer's childhood. If this is correct, it must be referred to the wetness of the dreamer, who is now a man of nearly thirty years of age. The bosom of the nurse is in reality an inn for the child. The nurse, as well as Dodd Sappho, appears as an illusion to his recently abandoned mistress. The elder brother of the patient also appears in the dream content. He is upstairs while the dreamer himself is downstairs. This again is an inversion, for the brother, as I happen to know, has lost his social position, while my patient has retained his. In relating the dream content, the dreamer avoided saying that his brother was upstairs and that he himself was downstairs. This would have been an obvious expression, for in Austria, we say that a man is on the ground floor when he has lost his fortune and social position, just as we say that he has come down. Now the fact at this point in the dream, something is represented as inverted must have a meaning, and the inversion must apply to some other relation between the dream thoughts and the dream content. There is an indication which suggests how this inversion is to be understood. It obviously applies to the end of the dream, where the circumstances of climbing are the reverse of those described in Sappho. Now it is evident what inversion is meant. In Sappho, the man carries the woman who stands in a sexual relation to him. In the dream thoughts, conversely, there is a reference to a woman carrying a man, and as this could occur only in childhood, the reference is once more to the nurse who carries the heavy child. Thus the final portion of the dream succeeds in representing Sappho and the nurse in the same allusion. Just as the name Sappho has not been selected by the poet without the reference to lesbian practice, so the portions of the dream in which people are busy upstairs and downstairs, above and beneath, point to the fantasies of the sexual content with which the dreamer is occupied, and which, as suppressed carvings, are not unconnected with this neurosis. Dream interpretation itself does not show that these are fancies and not memories of actual happenings. It only furnishes us with a set of thoughts and leaves it to us to determine their actual value. In this case, real and imagined happenings appear at first as of equal value, and not only here, but also in the creation of more important psychic structures than dreams. A large company, as we already know, signifies a secret. The brother is none other than a representative drawn into the scenes of childhood by fancying backwards of all the subsequent for women's favours. Through the medium of an experience indifferent in itself, the episode of the gentleman who talks angrily of the king of Italy refers to the intrusion of people of low rank into aristocratic society. It is as though a warning which Dudet gives to young men were to be supplemented by a similar warning applicable to a suckling child. The fantastic nature of the situation relating the dreamer's wet nurse is shown by the circumstance objectively ascertained that the nurse in this case was his mother. In the two dreams here cited, I have shown by italics where one of the elements of the dream recurs in the dream thoughts in order to make the multiple relations of the former more obvious. Since, however, the analysis of these dreams has not been carried to completion, it will probably be worthwhile to consider a dream with a full analysis in order to demonstrate the manifold determination of the dream content. For this purpose, 
I shall select the dream of Irma's injection. See chapter 2. From this example, we shall readily see that the condensation work in the dream formation has made use of more means than one. The chief person in the dream content is my patient Irma, who is seen with the features which belong to her waking life, and who, therefore, in the first instance represents herself, but her attitude as an examiner at the window is taken from a recollection of another person, of the lady for whom I should like to exchange my patient, as is shown by the dream thoughts. Inasmuch as Irma has a diphtheritic memory, which recalls my anxiety about my eldest daughter, she comes to represent this child of mine, behind whom, connected with her by the identity of their names, is concealed the person of the patient who died from the effects of the poison. In the further course of the dream, the significance of Irma's personality changes, without the alteration of her image as it is seen in the dream. She becomes one of the children whom we examine in the public dispensaries for children's diseases. Where my friends display the difference in their mental capacities, the transition was obviously affected by the idea of my little daughter. Owing to her unwillingness to open her mouth, the same Irma constitutes an allusion to another lady who was examined by me, and also in the same connection to my wife. Further, in the morbid changes which I discover in her throat, I have summarized allusions to quite a number of other persons. All these people whom I encounter as I follow up the association suggested by Irma do not appear personally in the dream. They are concealed behind the dream person Irma, who is thus developed into collective image, which, as might be expected, has contradictory features. Irma comes to represent these other persons who are discarded in the work of condensation. Inasmuch as I follow anything to happen to her, which reminds me of these persons, trait by trait. For the purposes of the dream condensation, I may construct a composite person in yet another fashion, by combining the actual features of two or more persons in a single dream image. It is in this fashion that the Dr. M of my dream was constructed. He bears the name Dr. M and he speaks and acts as Dr. M does, but his bodily characteristics and his malady belong to another person, my elder brother, a single feature, paleness, is doubly determined, owing to the fact that it is common to both persons. Dr. R in my dream about my uncle is a similar composite person. But here the dream image is constructed in yet another fashion. I have not united features peculiar to the one person with the features of the other, thereby abridging by certain features the memory picture of each. But I have adopted the method employed by Galton in producing family portraits, namely, I have superimposed the two images so that the common features stand out in stronger relief, while those which do not coincide neutralize one another and become indistinct. In the dream of my uncle, the fair beard stands out in relief as an emphasized feature from a physiognomy which belongs to two persons and which is consequently blurred. Further, in its reference to growing grey, the beard contains an allusion to my father and to myself. The construction of collective and composite persons is one of the principal methods of dream condensation. We shall presently have occasion to deal with this in another connection. The notion of dysentery in the dream of Irma's injection was likewise a multiple determination. On the one hand, because of paraphasic assonance with diphtheria, and on the other, because of its reference to the patient whom I sent to the East, and whose hysteria had been wrongly diagnosed. The mention of propiles in the dream proves again to be an interesting case of condensation. Not propiles, but amyles were included in the dream thoughts. One might think that here is a simple displacement had occurred in the course of the dream formation. This is in fact the case, but the displacement serves the purpose of the condensation, as is shown by the following supplementary analysis. If I dwell for a moment upon the word propline, German, its assonance with the word Propylium suggests itself to me. But Propylium is to be found not only in Athens but also in Munich. In the latter city, a year before my dream, I had visited a friend who was seriously ill, and the reference to him in Trimethyl Amin, which follows closely upon Propyls, is unmistakable. I pass over the striking circumstances that here, as elsewhere in the analysis of dreams, Associations of most widely differing values are employed by making thought connections as though they were equivalent, 
and I yield to the temptation to regard the procedure by which amyles in the dream thoughts are replaced in the dream content by propias as a sort of plastic process. On the one hand, here is a group of ideas relating to my friend Otto, who does not understand me, thinks I am in the wrong, and gives me the liquor that smells of amyles. On the other hand, there is a group of ideas connected with the first, by contrast, relating to my Berlin friend, who does understand me, who would always think that I was right, and to whom I am indebted for so much valuable information concerning the chemistry of sexual processes. What elements in the auto group are to attract my particular attention are determined by the recent circumstances which are responsible for the dream. Amiles belong to the elements so distinguished which are predestined to find their way into the dream content. The large group of ideas centering upon William is actually stimulated by the contrast between William and Otto, and those elements in it are emphasized which are in tune with those already stood up in the Otto group. In the whole of this dream, I am continually recoiling from somebody who excites my displeasure towards another person with whom I can at will confront the first. Trade by trade, I appeal to the friend as against the enemy. Thus, a miles in the Otto group awakes recollections in the other group, also belonging to the region of chemistry. Trimethylamine, which receives support from several quarters, finds its way into the dream content. A miles too might have got into the dream content unchanged, but yields to the influence of the William group, inasmuch as out of the old range of recollections, covered by this name, an element is sought out which is able to furnish a double determination for Amiles. Propiles is closely associated with Amiles. From the William group comes Munich with its propelium, but both groups are united in the Propiles propelium. As though by a compromise, this intermediate element then makes its way into the dream content. Here a common mean which permits of a multiple determination has been created. It thus becomes palpable that a multiple determination must facilitate penetration into the dream content. For the purpose of this dream formation, a placement of the attention has been unhesitatingly effected what is really intended to something adjacent to its associations. The study of the dream of Irma's injection has now enabled us to obtain some insight into the process of condensation which occurs in the formation of dreams. We perceive as peculiarities of the condensing process a selection of those elements which occur several times over in the dream content. The formation of new unities composite persons, mixed images, and the production of the common means. The purpose which is served by the condensation and the means by which it is brought about will be investigated when we come to the study in all their bearings the psychic process at work in the formation of dreams. Let us for the present be content with establishing the fact of dream condensation as the relation between the dream thoughts and the dream content which deserves the attention. The condensation work of dreams becomes most palpable when it takes words and means as its objects. Generally speaking, words are often treated in dreams as things and therefore undergo the same combination as idea of things. The result of such dreams are comical and bizarre word formations. 1. A colleague sent an essay of his in which he had, in my opinion, overestimated the value of a recent physiological discovery and he had expressed himself, moreover, in extravagant terms. On the following night, I dreamed a sentence which is obviously referred to this essay. That is truly Norectal style. The solution of this word formation at first gave me some difficulty. It was unquestionably formed as a parody of the superlative colossal pyramidal, but it is not easy to say where it came from. At last the monster fell apart into the two names, Nora and Ekdal, from the two well-known plays by Ibsen. I had previously read a newspaper article on Ibsen by the writer, whose latest work I was now criticizing in the dream. 2. One of my female patients dreams that a man with a fair beard and a peculiar glittering eye is pointing to a signboard attached to a tree which reads, Uclemparia, wet. Analysis the man was rather authoritative looking and his peculiar glittering eye at once recalled the church of San Paolo near Rome where she had seen the mosaic portraits of the popes. One of the early popes had a golden eye. This is really an optical illusion to which the guides usually call attention. Further associations showed that the general physiognomy of the man corresponded with her own clergyman. 
and the shape of the fair beard recalled her doctor, myself, while the stature of the man in the dream recalled her father. All these persons stand in the same relation to her. They are all guiding and directing the course of her life. On further questioning, the golden eye recalled the gold money, the rather expensive psychoanalytic treatment, which gives her a great deal of concern. Gold, moreover, recalls the gold cure for alcoholism. Her D, whom she would have married if it had not been for his clinging to the disgusting alcohol habit, she does not object to anyone's taking an occasional drink. She herself sometimes drinks beer and liquors. This again brings her back to a visit to San Paulo and its surroundings. She remembers that in the neighboring monastery of the Trefontaine, she drank a liquor made of eucalyptus by the Trappist monks of the monastery. She then relates how the monks transformed this malarial and swampy region into a dry and wholesome neighborhood by planting numbers of eucalyptus trees. The word eucalyptaria, which resolves itself into eucalyptus and malaria, and the word wet refers to the former swampy nature of the locality. Wet also suggests dry. Dry is actually the name of the man whom she would have married but for his overindulgence in alcohol. The peculiar name of dry is of Germanic origin. Dry meaning tree and hence alludes to the monastery of the three dry fountains. In talking of Mr. Dry's habit, she used the strong expression he could drink a fountain. Mr. Dry jocosely refers to his habit by saying, You know I must drink because I am always dry, referring to his name. The eucalyptus refers also to her neurosis, which was at first diagnosed as malaria. She went to Italy because her attacks of anxiety, which were accompanied by marked rigors and shivering, were thought to be of malarial origin. She brought some eucalyptus oil from the monks, and she maintains that it was done her much good. The condensation Uclamperia wet is, therefore, the point of junction for the dream, as well as the neurosis. 3. In a rather long and confused dream of my own, the apparent nucleus of which is a sea voyage, it occurs to me that the next port is Hersing, and the next after that Fleece. The latter is the name of my friend in B, to which city I have often journeyed. But her seeing is put together from the names of the places in the neighborhood of Vienna, which so frequently end with ing, Heidsing, Lysing, Modeling, the old Medlitz, Me Delicie, my joy, that is, my own name, the German for joy being Freuder, and the English hearsay, which points to calumny, and establishes the relation to the indifferent dream stimulus of the day. A poem in Fleeg and a Bladder about a slanderous dwarf, sagt der harten gesagt, by the combination of the final syllabi I and G, with the name Fleas, Flizingen is obtained, which is a real port through which my brother passes when he comes to visit us from England. But the English for Flizingen is flushing, which signifies blushing and recalls patients suffering from erythrophobia fear of blushing, whom I sometimes treat, and also a recent publication of best truths relating to this neurosis, the reading of which angered me. The same analysis and synthesis of syllabies, a veritable chemistry of syllabies, serves us for many a jest in waking life. What is the cheapest method of obtaining silver? You go to a field where silver berries are growing and pick them. Then the berries are eliminated and the silver remains in free state. The first person who read and criticized this book made an objection with which the other readers will probably agree that the dreamer often appears too witty. That is true, so long as it applies to the dreamer. It involves a condemnation only when its application is extended to the interpreter of the dream. In waking reality, I can make very little claim to the predicate witty. If my dream appear witty, that is not the fault of my individuality but of the peculiar psychological conditions under which the dream is fabricated and is intimately connected with the theory of wit and comical. The dream becomes witty because the shortest and most direct way to the expression of its thoughts is barred for it. The dream is under constraint. My reader may convince themselves that the dreams of my patients give the impression of being quite as witty, at least in intention, as my own and even more so. Nevertheless, this reproach impelled me to compare the technique of it with the dream work. 
4. Upon another occasion, I had a dream which consisted of two separate parts. The first was the vividly remembered word, Autodidascar, and the second was a faithful reproduction in the dream content of a short and harmless fancy which had been developed a few days earlier, and which was to effect that I must tell Professor N. when I next saw him. The patient about whose condition I last consulted you is really suffering from neurosis, just as you suspected. So not only must the newly coined word, autodidascar, satisfy the requirement that it should contain or represent a compressed meaning, but this meaning must have a valid connection with my resolve repeated from waking life to give Professor N. due credit for his diagnosis. Now, autodidascar is easily separated into author, German, author, autodidact, and Lasker, with whom is associated the name Lasalle. The first of these words leads me to the occasion of the dream, which this time is significant. I had brought home to my wife several volumes of a well-known author, who is a friend of my brother's, and who, as I have learned, comes from the same neighborhood as myself, J. J. David. One evening she told me how profoundly impressed she had been by the pathetic sadness of a story in one of David's novels, A Story of Wasted Lands, and our conversation turned into signs of talent which we perceive in our own children. Under the influence of what she had read, my wife expressed some concern about our children, and I comforted her with the remark that precisely such degree as she feared can be averted by training. During the night my thoughts proceeded farther, took up my wife's concern for the children, and interwove with it all sorts of other things. Something which the novelist had said to my brother on the subject of marriage showed my thoughts a path which might lead to representation in the dream. This path led to Brislow, a lady who was a very good friend of ours, had married and gone to live there. I found in Brislow Lasker and Lasalle two examples to justify the fear lest our boy should be ruined by women. Examples which enabled me to represent simultaneously two ways of influencing a man to his undoing. The Churchill affirm, by which these thoughts may be summarized, leads me, if taken in another sense, to my brother, who is still married and whose name is Alexander. Now I see that Alex, as we abbreviate the name, sounds almost like an inversion of Lasker, and that this fact must have contributed to send my thoughts on a detour by a way of Breslau. But the playing with names and syllabus in which I am here engaged has yet another meaning. It represents the wish that my brother may enjoy a happy family life, and this in the following manner. In the novel of artistic life, the oeuvre, which by virtue of its content, must have been in association with my dream thoughts, the author as is well known, has incidentally given a description of his own person and his own domestic happiness, and appears under the name of Sandoz. In the metamorphosis of his name, he probably went to work as follows. Zola, when inverted, gives aloes, but this was still too undisguised. He therefore replaced the last syllable al, which stands at the beginning of the name Alexander, by the third syllable of the same name and thus arrived at Sandoz. My autodidascar originates in a similar fashion. My fantasy that I am telling Professor N that the patient whom we have both seen is suffering from neurosis found its way into the dream in the following manner. Shortly before the close of my working year, I had a patient in whose case my powers of diagnosis failed me. The serious organic trouble, possibly some alternative degeneration of the spinal cord, was to be assumed, but could not be conclusively demonstrated. It would have been tempting to diagnose the trouble as a neurosis, and this would have put an end to all my difficulties, but for the fact that the sexual anamnesis, failing which I am unwilling to admit a neurosis, was so energetically denied by the patient. In my embarrassment, I called to my assistance a physician whom I respect most of all men, and to whose authority I surrendered most completely. He listened to my doubts and told me he thought them justified, and then said, Keep on observing the man, it is probably a neurosis. Since I know that he does not share my opinions concerning the etiology of the neurosis, I refrained from contradicting him, but I did not conceal my skepticism. 
A few days later, I informed the patient that I did not know what to do with him and advised him to go to someone else. Thereupon, to my great astonishment, he began to beg my pardon for having lied to me. He had felt so ashamed and he now revealed to me just a piece of sexual etiology which I had expected and which I found necessary for assuming the existence of a neurosis. This was a relief to me, but at the same time a humiliation, for I had to admit that my consultant, who was not disconcerted by the absence of anamnesis, had judged the case more correctly. I made up my mind to tell him, when I next saw him, that he had been right and I had been wrong. This is just what I do in the dream, but what sort of a wish is fulfilled if I acknowledge that I am mistaken? This is precisely my wish. I wish to be mistaken as regards my fears, that is to say, I wish that my wife, whose fears I have appropriated in my dream thoughts, may prove to be mistaken. The subject to which the fact of being right or wrong is related in the dream is not far remote from that which is really of interest to the dream thoughts. We have the same pair of alternatives of either organic or functional impairment caused by a woman or actually by the sexual life, either diabetic paralysis or a neurosis, with which latter the nature of LaSalle's undoing is indirectly connected. In this well-constructed dream, Professor N. appears not merely on the account of his analogy, and my wish to be proved mistaken, or associated references to Breslau and the family of our married friend who lives there, but also on the account of the following little dialogue which followed our consultation. After he had acquitted himself to his professional duties by making the above-mentioned suggestion, Dr. N. proceeded to discuss personal matters. How many children have you now? 6. A thoughtful and respectful gesture. Girls, boys? 3 each. They are the pride of my riches. Well, you must be careful. There is no difficulty about the girls. But the boys are a difficulty later on as regards their upbringing. I replied that until now they had been very tractable. Obviously this prognosis of my boy's future pleased me as little as the diagnosis of my patient, whom he believed to be suffering only from a neurosis. These two impressions, then, are connected by their continuity, by their being successively received. And when I incorporate the story of the neurosis into the dream, I substitute it for the conversation on the subject of the upbringing which is even more closely connected with the dream thoughts. Since it touches so closely upon the anxiety subsequently expressed by my wife, thus even my fear that N may prove to be right in his remarks on the difficulties to be met with in bringing up boys is admitted into the dream content, inasmuch as it is concealed behind the representation of my wish that I may be wrong to harbour such apprehensions. The same fantasy serves without alteration to represent both the conflicting alternatives. Examination dreams present the same difficulties to the interpretation that I have already described as characteristic of most typical dreams. The associative material which the dreamer supplies only rarely suffices for the interpretation. A deeper understanding of such dreams has to be accumulated from the considerable number of examples. Not long ago, I arrived at a conviction that reassurance is like, but you are already a doctor and so on, not only convey a consolation, but imply a reproach as well. This would have done, you are already so old, so far advanced in life, and yet you will commit such follies, are guilty of such childish behavior. This mixture of self-criticism and consolation would correspond with the examination dreams. After this, it is no longer surprising that the reproaches in the last analyzed examples concerning follies and childish behaviors should relate to the repetitions of the reprehensible sexual acts. The verbal transformations in the dream are very similar to those which are known to occur in paranoia and which are observed also in hysteria and obsession. The linguistic tricks of children who at a certain age actually treat words as objects and even invent new language and artificial syntaxes are a common source of such occurrences both in dreams and psychoneurosis. The analysis of nonsensical word formation in dreams is particularly well suited to demonstrate the degree of condensation affected in the dream work. From the small number of selected examples here considered, it must not be concluded that such material is seldom observed or is it at all exceptional. It is, on the contrary, very frequent. 
but owing to the dependence of dream interpretation on psychoanalytic treatment, very few examples are noted down and reported, and most of the analyses which are reported are comprehensible only to the specialist in neuropathology. When a spoken utterance, expressly distinguished as such from a thought, occurs in a dream, it is an invariable rule that the dream speech has originated from remembered speech in the dream material. The wording of the speech has either been preserved in its entirety or has been slightly altered in expression. Frequently, the dream speech is pieced together from different recollections of spoken remarks. The wording has remained the same, but the sense has perhaps become ambiguous or differs from the wording. Not infrequently, the dream speech serves merely as an allusion to an incident in connection with which the remembered speech was made. In the case of a young man who was suffering from the obsessions, but whose intellectual functions were intact and highly developed, I recently found the only exception to this rule. The speeches which occurred in his dreams did not originate in speeches which he had heard had made himself, but correspond to the undistorted verbal expression of his obsessive thoughts, which came to his waking conscious only in an altered form. End of section 26 Read by Lambda Section 27 of The Interpretation of Dreams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Interpretation of Dreams by Sigmund Freud. Translated by A. A. Brill. Section 27. The Work of Displacement. Another, and probably no less significant, relation must have already forced itself upon our attention while we were collecting examples of dream condensation. We may have noticed that these elements which obtrude themselves in the dream content as its essential components do not by any means play the same part in the dream thoughts. As a corollary to this, the converse of this statement is also true. That which is obviously the essential content of the dream thoughts need not be represented at all in the dream. The dream is, as it were, centered elsewhere. Its content is arranged about elements which do not constitute the central point of the dream thoughts. Thus, for example, in the dream of the botanical monograph, the central point of the dream content is evidently the element botanical. In the dream thoughts, we are concerned with the complications and conflicts resulting from services rendered between colleagues which place them under mutual obligations. Later on, with the reproach that I am in the habit of sacrificing too much time to my hobbies, and the element botanical finds no place in this nucleus of the dream thoughts unless it is loosely connected with it by antithesis, for botany was never among my favorite subjects. In the Sappho dream of my patient, ascending and descending, being upstairs and down, is made the central point, the dream, however, is concerned with the danger of sexual relations with persons of low degree, so that only one of the elements of the dream thought seem to have found its way into the dream content, and this is unduly expanded. Again, in the dream of my uncle, the fair beard which seems to be its central point appears to have no rational connection with the desire for greatness which we have recognized as the nucleus of the dream thoughts. Such dreams very naturally give us an impression of a displacement. In complete contrast to these examples, the dream of Irma's injection shows that individual elements may claim the same place in dream formation as that which they occupy in the dream thoughts. The recognition of this new and utterly inconstant relation between the dream thoughts and the dream content will probably astonish us at first. If we find in a psychic process of normal life that one idea has been selected from among a number of others and has acquired a particular emphasis in our consciousness, we are wont to regard this as proof that a peculiar psychic value, a certain degree of interest, attaches to the victorious idea. We now discover that this value of the individual element in the dream thoughts is not retained in dream formation or is not taken into account. For there is no doubt which of the elements of the dream thoughts are of the highest value. Our judgment informs us immediately. In dream formation, the essential elements, those that are emphasized by intensive interest, may be treated as though they were subordinate, while they are replaced in the dream by other elements, which were certainly subordinate in the dream thoughts. 
It seems at first as though the psychic intensity of individual ideas were of no account in their selection for dream formation, but only their greater or lesser multiplicity of determination. One might be inclined to think that what gets into the dream is not what is important in the dream thoughts, but what is contained in them several times over. But our understanding of dream formation is not much advanced by this assumption. To begin with, we cannot believe that the two motives of multiple determination and intrinsic value can influence the selection of the dream otherwise than in the same direction. Those ideas in the dream thoughts which are most important are probably also those which recur most frequently, since the individual dream thoughts radiate from them as centers. And yet, the dream may reject these intensely emphasized and extensively reinforced elements, and may take up into its content other elements which are only extensively reinforced. The psychic intensity or value of an idea, the emphasis due to interest, is of course to be distinguished from perceptual or conceptual intensity. This difficulty may be solved if we follow up yet another impression received during the investigation of the overdetermination of the dream content. Many readers of this investigation may already have decided in their own minds that the discovery of the multiple determination of the dream elements is of no great importance because it is inevitable. Since in analysis we proceed from the dream elements and register all the ideas which associate themselves with those elements, is it any wonder that these elements should recur with peculiar frequency in the thought material obtained in this manner? While I cannot admit the validity of this objection, I am now going to say something that sounds rather like it. Among the thoughts which analysis brings to light are many which are far removed from the nucleus of the dream, and which stand out like artificial interpolations made for a definite purpose. Their purpose may readily be detected. They establish a connection, often a forced and far-fetched connection, between the dream content and the dream thoughts. And in many cases, if these elements were weeded out of the analysis, the components of the dream content would not only not be overdetermined, they would not be sufficiently determined. We are thus led to the conclusion that multiple determination, decisive as regards the selection made by the dream, is perhaps not always a primary factor in dream formation, but is often a secondary product of a psychic force which is, as yet, unknown to us. Nevertheless, it must be of importance for the entrance of the individual elements into the dream, for we may observe that in cases where multiple determination does not proceed easily from the dream material, it is brought about with a certain effort. It now becomes very probable that a psychic force expresses itself in the dream work, which, on the one hand, strips the elements of the high psychic value of their intensity, and on the other hand, by means of overdetermination, creates new significant values from elements of slight value, which new values then make their way into the dream content. Now, if this is the method of procedure, there has occurred in the process of dream formation a transference and displacement of the psychic intensities of individual elements, from which results the textual difference between the dream content and the thought content. The process which we here assume to be operative is actually the most essential part of the dream work. It may fitly be called dream displacement. Dream displacement and dream condensation are the two craftsmen to whom we may chiefly ascribe the structure of the dream. I think it will be easy to recognize the psychic force which expresses itself in dream displacement. The result of this displacement is that the dream content no longer has any likeness to the nucleus of the dream thoughts, and the dream reproduces only a distorted form of the dream wish in the unconscious but we are already acquainted with dream distortion, we have traced it back to the censorship which one psychic instance in the psychic life exercises over another. Dream displacement is one of the chief means of achieving this distortion. Is fecit qui profuit. We must assume that dream displacement is brought about by the influence of this censorship, the endopsychic defense. Since I regard the attribution of dream distortion to the censorship as a central point of my conception of the dream, I will here quote the closing passage of a story, Traumen wie Wachen, from Phantasien eines Realisten by Lincaeus, Vienna, 2nd edition, 1900, in which I find this chief feature of my doctrine reproduced. Quote, Concerning a man who possesses the remarkable faculty of never dreaming nonsense, your marvelous faculty of dreaming as if you were awake is based upon your virtues, upon your goodness, your justice, and your love of truth. It is the moral clarity of your nature which makes everything about you intelligible to me. 
but if I really give thought to the matter, was the reply, I almost believe that all men are made as I am, and that no one ever dreams nonsense. A dream which one remembers so distinctly that one can relate it afterwards, and which therefore is no dream of delirium, always has a meaning. Why, it cannot be otherwise, for that which is in contradiction to itself can never be combined into a whole. The fact that time and space are often thoroughly shaken up detracts not at all from the real content of the dream, because both are without any significance whatever for its essential content. We often do the same thing in waking life. Think of fairy tales, of so many bold and pregnant creations of fantasy, of which only a foolish person would say, that is nonsense, for it isn't possible. If only it were always possible to interpret dreams correctly, as you have just done with mine, said the friend. That is certainly not an easy task, but with a little attention, it must always be possible to the dreamer. You ask, why is it generally impossible? In your case, there seems to be something veiled in your dreams, something unchaste in a special and exalted fashion, a certain secrecy in your nature which it is difficult to fathom, and that is why your dreams so often seem to be without meaning or even nonsensical. But in the profoundest sense, this is by no means the case. Indeed, it cannot be, for a man is always the same person whether he wakes or dreams. End quote. The manner in which the factors of displacement, condensation, and overdetermination interact with one another in dream formation, which is the ruling factor and which is the subordinate one, all of this will be reserved as a subject for later investigation. In the meantime, we may state, is a second condition which the elements that find their way into the dream must satisfy, that they must be withdrawn from the resistance of the censorship. But henceforth, in the interpretation of dreams, we shall reckon with dream displacement as an unquestionable fact. End of section 27. Section 28 of the Interpretation of Dreams this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Interpretation of Dreams by Sigmund Freud Translated by A. A. Brill Section 28 The Means of Representation in Dreams, Part 1 Besides the two factors of condensation and displacement in dreams, which we have found to be at work in the transformation of the latent dream material into the manifest dream content, we shall, in the course of this investigation, come upon two further conditions which exercise an unquestionable influence over the selection of the material that eventually appears in the dream. But first, even at the risk of seeming to interrupt our progress, I shall take a preliminary glance at the processes by which the interpretation of dreams is accomplished. I do not deny that the best way of explaining them and of convincing the critic of their reliability would be to take a single dream as an example to detail its interpretation, as I did in Chapter 2, in the case of the dream of Irma's injection, but then to assemble the dream thoughts which I had discovered, and from them to reconstruct the formation of the dream, that is to say, to supplement dream analysis by dream synthesis. I have done this with several specimens for my own instruction, but I cannot undertake to do it here, as I am prevented by a number of considerations relating to the psychic material necessary for such a demonstration, such as any right-thinking person would approve. 